The following program deals with a controversial, controversial subject. The theories expressed they are not the only possible interpretation. Yeah. The viewer is invited yeah. to make a judgment based <laughs> yeah. on the information. Yeah, and actually, and every once in a while, I'll do this. I'll just wave my hands like I'm screaming backstage at one of these guys, and it just looks like I'm insane to them. And they're like, oh my god, this is going to do something stupid this episode. And uh, then I just go, hi guys, how you doing? Jesse, you do know you're stealing my hat, right? This hat? Yes, yes. I, I made those for New York. I think I gave you one. No, 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 no. I got this, like, okay. 2016, dude. Yeah, I, 2017. I, sent, I sent them to New York Comic Con in 2016 when I had to go to... Whatever. Uh, I don't see your name. I don't see no name tags in here. Uh, okay.
the top talents in the comic book business are here to tell everything they know. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode seven of the Industry of Comics show, a bucket list episode for Beyond Wednesdays. I am joined by, of course, my two amazing co-hosts, Dennis Barger of Wonder World Comics, Jesse James of Jesse James Comics, and our esteemed guest, Mr. Rob Liefeld. Thank you, sir. Esteemed. That's right. Esteemed. No, hey. thanks for having me. You guys, thanks for having me. This is fun. Yep. So, Rob, uh, so when we started this show, yes, Jesse and I, basically, we wanted to have a show that was kind of in between what everybody else was doing at the top notch. Yeah. Uh, I've loved your content. Rob Servations, if you're out there listening, you never listen to a Rob Servation over on, is it Apple Podcast? Everywhere. All podcast. All it's podcast. Everywhere. Yeah. So I listen to it on Apple. So appreciate, um, it. appreciate it. And so you got Rob's podcast, which is fucking amazing. And if you, I just listened to his uh, last episode yes uh, today this morning, it's phenomenal. You got to watch it. Thank you. And then I had a whole bunch of guys. No offense, Brian. You guys were down here. You did. You you had a whole lot of great content, but you didn't understand. You were like like oh why did these people do this and why did these people do this and why did these people do this and I'm like well. You have to understand there's a middle level that you guys aren't comprehending. And Jesse and I were trying to fill that middle. So tonight we brought on Rob to help us fill all the way across the board. So that you know, everybody you know I love you guys. left to right. I've known you. I, I just want everybody watching to know I've known Jesse and Dennis a long time. Uh, a, a plus 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 uh, retail minds out there. I've, I've jumped on your uh when you go live, Dennis, I, 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 I you, you, it's got a name. You, you call it something. Um, and then Jesse, I've always followed you and you've been great and you're an innovator. So two innovators honored to be on your show. Thanks for having me. Four inter innovators tonight, guys. Yeah, there you go. So Rob, uh, we do something that we do on every show. Okay. Uh, Brian, do the honors. So we like to ask everybody, other than selling comic books in said store, what makes a comic book store? For me, it, it look, for, first of all, you know, I was probably along with these two guys, I was there when comic stores happened, um, when, when Southern California got comic book stores. But I just call them the clubhouse because you're going to find like-minded people. Uh, you're going to strike up a conversation you're going to, you know, find, find you're going to make friends. It's clubhouse. And that's what I tell people all the time. Like, don't take your, don't you, don't take your clubhouse for granted. Uh, you got, you got to support your clubhouse because you don't want to pull up one day and have them tell you they're going out of business. And, uh, you know, I think it's getting harder than ever for the clubhouse to, to stay in business. And, and I, I saw stuff like this going a couple of years back with one of the retailers uh, who actually did end up abandoning his store. He was carrying less and less and less trade paperbacks, omnibuses, hardcovers. And he'd say, Rob, I can't compete. Just get it on Amazon. And I'm like, you're telling me to not shop at your store. And I'm I, like, it, I, I did start getting certain more expensive items on Amazon because I saw this guy with, I understand his situation, couldn't take as many risks, didn't want to take as many risks. But my wife will tell you, man, I, I pour one out for every store that goes out of business. I, I, I try and help them if they're, you know, I was in a store two years ago that the, the store said they were hurting. I tried to, I, I dropped a couple thousand dollars right there to see if I could help, you know, that they said they were hurting. And it, 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 it's a lot of overhead and they had a lot of inventory. And so I could find stuff I liked. You know, I love comics. I, comics are, <laughs> I got in trouble today. I told my wife as she was going out to the museum, I said, are you my first love or is it comics? And he like looked at me like, and then I realized there's a whole lot of other stuff I need in my life that comics are never going to give me. So I better re rephrase that pretty quick. But the passion is there. So I was just, I'm, I'm downtown Chicago right now with my daughter okay. um, yeah, for spring break. Uh, supervised spring break. Yeah, and we went over to see the Bean and the um, museum, and both of them are closed today. But right around the corner, if you're familiar with Chicago, is one of the oldest comic book institutions in yes. Chicago, Graham Crackers Comics. Right. Uh, 
Brian, can you pull up my Facebook when you have a second? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I know Jamie. I know. I need. I know Jamie Graham. We, we go way back with Jamie. Um, Jamie has, I think, what seven stores now? Six, six or seven stores. Yeah. He's kind of the Phil Boyle of Chicago. Yes. Um. So. As I have moved away from new comics, and I, I still visit these new comic stores, I go into Jamie's. I, I have all the girls there all buying manga. One girl actually was buying indie comics. I bought Dr. Horrible's sing-along Dark Horse comic that, mm -hmm. written by Joss Whedon for my daughter because she loves Joss Whedon. And um, there, right when I was there, their Penguin Random House order showed up. And I wanted to bring this up to you. If you go to the last picture, that's my daughter's friends. Um, go go to the last picture on that. Right there. So one more picture. This is downtown Graham Cracker. Look at yep. this. This is this is what the shit is still happening, man. That's that happened to Jamie Graham today. Both sides of that are exploded. That's a bummer. You know, you it's just yeah no it's 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 terrible bummer it's it's uh it it's really does not help the situation and yeah I know you have long people who don't know dennis is the box guy he will bring the beat up boxes to diamond at their uh at their at their diamond retail roundups and you will you, you used to give them hell right yeah and they like i said it still has it fixed you know it's at a certain point you have insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome and i said i can't do that anymore yeah Hold it's on, interesting Jesse. like i said i, I my, my, my uh i know when marvel stir first started yeah. two years back with with uh with penguin i know that penguin was not P penguin admitted that they had to do a better job packing the books because so many of the books were getting damaged and and the paper quality of the books is sometimes on a much cheaper stock. So it gets dented and damaged. And you know what, Dennis and Jesse, I had to learn the hard way, really learn the hard way from, from the retail, from the fans. They are trying to pull the best possible copy of that book. They are trying to eyeball a nine, six, nine, seven, nine, eight. Right. And uh, I mean, that's the world we live in now. Whereas, no, but, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. You, you go. No, no, but a lot of people don't understand also. Rob is uh, a retailer also at his level because he makes his own variants. Uh, yeah. for, for, what's your web, website, Rob? You know, right now I, st I stopped selling two years ago on RobLifeoldCreations.com. There's a lot of stuff. RobLifeoldCreations.com has art. It has blogs. But um, it really now just serves as a purpose to but, tell, you, you know, tell you where I'm, yeah. I'm at. But that's what I love about, uh, you know, creators at your level also come down into our retailer level yeah. and then you all of a sudden you get this blindsided smack in the face like wait a second these retailers weren't absolutely insane when they were bitching about quality sure, sure. and packing uh, i'm good friends with uh, a lot of guys who do their own variants now creators and they're like dennis i can't believe you you i didn't listen to you i mean i i heard you but I didn't think it was going to affect me. And then all of a sudden I got my first variant uh, for my, my website. And guess what? The same problems you've always been complaining yeah. about. Rob, you, yeah, uh, yeah. you, you started recently um, doing the live sales and I got to yeah. tell you, we check in on you every Saturday and Wednesday night. I do a live show. Okay. And if you're, if okay. you're streaming, we do a quick check in on you because I got to well, tell you, you, I love, your live sales, I look at it as great content. It's not yeah. as good as Rob Servations content wise, but sure. it is excellent, man. Well, you're getting me you're getting me fairly raw. I tell people if you're gonna come in, I mean the, the, the thing about the whatnot live stream is you know, people are talking at you the entire time. And so it can be very distracting because I'm trying to uh, share, you know, the the best possible story I can give you along with this comic, this uh, you know, look, I, I never saw a live stream and I've never been in anyone else's live stream. And people tell me that my live stream is different. And I just like to think it's the level of engagement because I just, I, I feel very, I feel a lot of pressure. If you're going to come in and you're going to engage with me, I want it to be, you know, interesting. And I've had to, 
I've had to limit my stories now too because you know the next thing you know somebody's taping you and they're sharing a clip of you and sometimes it's out of context and so there's a lot of gotcha going on now um so now if i'm going to do a todd mcfarlane impersonation i turn <laughs> the camera upside down and and i and so you're basically filming me from the chin up um and you can hear me but i said before i do this now i literally turn the ipad so now the camera's down here and it's a terrible picture so go ahead and i even say did you clip that did you get that to send out you know um, yeah but no it's, live it's streaming, amazing i think so i i wish i had been on live streaming earlier because of the engagement and the um it's just very fulfilling and i've gotten to know so many people uh some great people and so we've been on for 20 i think 20 months and uh and and i was talking to jesse before we went live and like we we were both talking about shipping and you know we've earned our our five star rating and we've shipped ten thousand items which is not a lot to you guys but for me in, in 20 months it's a lot and we've maintained our five star, uh, you know, rating because we get the book there fast. We get them fast. We get them in good condition, and uh, it's exciting. Again, it's it's very, you know, it, it's just it, it, anything that brings me closer engagement to the customers is is better. I, I enjoy that the most because it's why we do it. It's like a concert. I mean, people understand we're performers. We want to perform. We want to. You know, I have very, I, I have a, I have a section of the show where I offer what I call very affordable artwork. It's smaller. It's eight and a half by eleven. Um, it's 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 basically like a starter kit. This is something you can afford. You know, my cover to so and so may have just sold from my d dealer, not an auction, may have sold for twenty grand. But here is a sketch that that I'm going to start out at two hundred dollars. So it's, it's it's a more affordable buy-in. But I, I just. I really dig it. Live streaming is, is so fun, you know. So, what we see well, when Rob, we watch. Do you do you feel that the way the customer service thing has changed over the years, from really zero contact to almost a hundred percent contact, has that yes. changed the way that you have evolved and pivoted in selling? J Jesse, it has changed a hundred percent. I know you are a pioneer of the live streaming. <coughs> I, I have friends. Who were reserving spaces on your Facebook shows pre-pandemic, pre-pandemic when you were getting that off the ground, and how much people wanted to be on your network? Uh, and like I said, I just never really did it until the pandemic. The pandemic forced a lot of stuff. It forced me to get into podcasting because I was so damn lonely. People forget, man. That pandemic year was garbage. We people were scared. You know, my 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 kids. We were more liberal, and it in letting kid, our, our kids out and not being as afraid um, in an orange County, California, w people were much less restrictive, but then our governor heard that our beaches were open and our parks were open and did the best to make us as, as miserable as, as he could in, in, in restricting us. But other families that we knew that w their kids couldn't come over. I remember my daughter would have to go and sit in the back of her car with the hatch up and her friends with that. You know, remember, that's just four years ago. It was miserable. And even some of my friends that I would regularly see, we weren't seeing each other anymore because everyone was so scared of the virus. And um, so I turned to, you know, podcasting to really just have a way to communicate. But the, the direct to consumer, Jesse, that is the biggest growth that is going to happen in this business over the next decade. That's bottom line. And it is it takes discipline. You've got to partner with people who know what they're doing to re better best represent you in terms of getting the, the stuff to the consumer. But I, I I believe that direct to consumer may be the only way I exist as a, as a creator in the next couple of years. Like and don't and I'm going to tell you right now, the big two companies know this as well. The big two behind the curtains at the shows, the powers that be will tell you they realize um, when they say they know direct to consumer is is very much very much the wave of the future yeah well that's one of one of the things i also want to talk to you about wave of the future yeah um so you and i are really big on our families yeah i the first time i saw you at a convention yeah. i saw your kids at the convention you yeah. could spot them life boys a mile away <laughs> um but we're also here with 
Jesse, who started at 13 years old and is yeah. here because he's dragged into the comic book industry. Um, you know, one of the biggest names in the comic book uh, YouTube space, Comic Tom. Yeah. He's the son of a comic book retailer. Yeah. So when you start to see that connection and then, you know, listening to Rob's observations about going to uh, the NCAA or the, the, the basketball games with yes. the kids and, uh, you know, all of the all of the celebrities, kids that your kids shot on, yep. Yep. Uh, you know, you've got to take the time to cultivate your family relationship almost as much as you are your business relationship, because yep. down the road, those guys are who we're handing this industry down to. Yeah. No, Dennis, look, and, and it's great that you brought your girls, your, your, your daughter and her friends to the comic store. Look, I, I have been, uh, you know, I've been that dad. Uh, my, my, my youngest son what, just fell in love with manga when he was five and never looked back. He, he really doesn't want anything to do with mainstream Marvel, Marvel DC. He is all about anime, all about manga, um, just consumes it as much as I consume Marvel and DC, you know, as a kid. Uh, my my me, oldest enjoys superheroes and comic books. He's not in love with them, uh, but but he was the generation raised on the movies and loves the 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 just loves to talk the the cartoons, the cinema. So I mean, they're out there, but I don't. I'm not going to lie to you. I don't see as many young people getting into comics as as there were when like when me and McFarlane and Lee were kind of breaking in because we saw a new generation of kids and I, and those are the kids and some of them I've watched growing up. I, I there's a couple of guys I could name them out loud. Uh, I saw them when they were 13, 14. And now I, I know them as, as, as 44 year olds or 43 year olds. Cause it's 30 years ago. So it's fun. And, but, but, but that generation of kids, I don't see it right now. I, I do not, yeah. you know, Yep, that's that's Extreme Studios right there. That that's the early days. That's really fun. Uh, so so I'm hoping. Uh, I mean, look, I'll, I'll just tell you, I was in a in a comic store, one of my favorite comic book stores, Tustin Tunes and Toys. Uh, shout out to everybody there, Mike and everybody. Uh, one of the last great stores in Orange County. It also happens. It it it's not hand in hand, but I I was retailing there in 1986 during Watchmen and Dark Knight. It was my my job. And uh, and it's just that they moved locations down the street and became an even better, uh, incredibly well-stocked stores. I, I, I knew 12, 15 years ago, because I don't know if you, I don't know what happened with you guys in the early 2000s. Most stores in Southern California had purged back issues of any kind. It was new issues, graphic novels, and then suddenly there was one guy in the business out here who came up with this killer store. And I walked in, I'm like, what am I looking at? Just aisles and aisles of back issues, the likes of which I encountered when I was a teenager. And he's like, dude, this is where it's at. You know, I'm, I'm bringing all this back. And he started the movement, whereas other stores in the area needed to start implementing that, even if it was five, you know, five rows of back issues, but, but um, here's, here's what you might've missed on that one, Rob. Uh, yeah. Jesse, tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, but I had all of these retailers at my very first Baltimore in 2005 and all of these retailers on the, what I call the snobby retailers. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of consider myself the um, Rodney Dangerfield and most of them okay. are all judge smales. They were okay. like, you're carrying floppy still. Don't you know yeah. floppies are going to be dead in five years? Oh, Why don't boy. you get with the picture and just start carrying trade paperbacks? Also, you need to have a book dealership. Uh, you need to have a book dealer so that you can get Captain Underpants and Dogman. Right. And I'm like, I want to I want to carry comics. Um, yeah, I'll carry trade paperbacks, but I, I really want comic books. Yeah. And I think there's something about, and, and for me, and this is one of the things, I think you might have actually said it a long time ago, Rob. There was a there's a moment when you get to the end of a comic book mm -hmm. where the creator has created a cliffhanger. Yes. And I liken it to Empire Strikes Back. Yes. Where you, the reader, don't know what's going to happen. And you have 30 days to speculate what the creator is going to do, how this is going to turn out. That is 
gone when you talk when you're reading a trade paperback. It's, That's it's just gone. Yeah. Oh, oh, what? Oh, there's the cliffhanger. Yeah. Oh, okay. I see what happens. He ducked it and didn't die. Okay, great. No, no, thirty months or no, thirty days of excitement. Well, also, the, I think one of the most important things, and Rob, you hit on it a lot in Rob's observations, and I love when you do it. And you kind of just talked about a comic book store. The vibe in a comic book store is about talking about those issues and and with everybody in there. That comic talk. Yeah. And that's my, one of my favorite things is saying, okay, you know, did you read this issue? What do you think is going to happen? You have a month to talk about it too, or however long to talk about it. And and that's one of the things that I don't think happens enough with kids, and 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 they don't learn about comics like we used to going into a comic, riding our bike to the comic shop, and that type of stuff. It's very hard to have uh, those conversations um, with anybody, yet alone kids, uh, in, in the comic world these days. Um, look, you're certainly right on the money, and and what I what I was getting to about I'm gonna, I'm going to jump up there, jump jump there, and tell you a comic store experience, and 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 li I mean li literally, these are my opinions, these are my thoughts. I don't profess to know anything. I just see things with my own mind, and I then I break it down and I try and kind of project. But Tustin Tunes and Toys has a killer. What I was trying to get to was a giant back issue. Uh, Huge back issue marketplace. Anybody in, in, in Orange County, go check out Tustin Tunes and Toys. Toys, trades, uh, the best selection of new books you're going to find because uh, they, they, they're they they're they're very up to date and they carry all the publishers. But it was uh, my oldest son was coming in for Christmas from Texas. We all the kids still have rooms here in the house, and so we were you know uh, he was flying into Orange County and Tustin Tunes and Toys is about ten minutes from there. I decided I will build in an extra hour to go to the comic store so that I can go and maybe grab some comics and see what's up. And guys, and you know this, you know, boom, comics, TNT, look at that shout out. You guys know this as retailers. Uh, it is the 40 to 60 uh, consumer that has, because I've seen it in my own fan base, those 13 year old kids that I told you that I saw in the 90s, they become doctors, lawyers, they become presidents of sales at, at their companies. And and there I am in custom, custom tunes and toys about a week before Christmas. And there's a bunch of guys who look like me. They're mm -hmm. my age. And they are buying slabs off the wall. They're buying back issues. They, they're, they've got the largest assortment of comics that they're bringing to the register. And I'm just, I'm kind of observing. I'm looking through back issues because I'm trying to get, at that point, I was trying to fill, fill some holes in my Marvel team-up collection Okay, from the 70s and 80s, but I'm I'm observing, and then six junior high boy boys came in, all with backpacks. School's out. It's about 3:30. The school is right down the street. They all walk in in mass. They're a group, and they walk all around. And what I can hear them talking about specifically, they mentioned Spider-Man, they mentioned Deadpool. Okay, Th those are two characters I was tracking, but they looked around. They showed each other comics. They pulled out the back issues. They looked at, they made comments. They left en masse. Not one of them bought anything. Not one of those kids. Now, I'm not saying the desire wasn't there. And who knows? Maybe they had already spent their money the week before, but they did not. They were aware that they, that they, they clearly liked going in there and perusing. But again, when I was there, a guy had just pulled up and he's like, hey, I saw on your Instagram to the manager that you had this one book. You still have this lab. And he bought a graded uh, Spider-Man. And I'm going to tell you, all these, the 40 to 60 set, we fell in love with comics in the 70s or, or late 60s. And we they their credit cards spend, okay? They are the ones. So, so what I'm bringing this to is, like, mainstream comic books is just like television. My kids tell me, Dad, why are you watching network news? What is that? <laughs> I'll watch, you know, NBC News or all cuz that's what I was trained. We grew up and we watched an anchor sit and read us the news. My kids don't watch any network television whatsoever. It's all off their phones or their iPads as as you all are aware of, but it's becoming it's it's I sit back and I wonder what the presidents of those networks cuz you know that they have hired futurists to analyze because their their audiences are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So what's their end game? What and and then I get back to where you guys live 
direct to consumer. You know what? If I have a rapport with you and I want to share my art and my comic book storytelling, what better than to connect with a dedicated group of people who enjoy what I do, right? I mean, that's right. And, well, and that, I, that leads me to the one of the first questions that I wanted to talk to you. We talked about uh, a little bit with um, Brian Polito last week. Yeah. But and, and you hit on it two times already tonight. We lost an entire generation to the NES. Yes. I feel your art, you, Todd, Wills, the entire image, you know, uh, right. hardcore mafia. You were the only thing that was speaking to those kids. Like they were not impressed with the yes. meat and potatoes, Marvel, whatever they were putting right. out or DC, whatever. They were you. You had the moment to hit those NES kids that we lost. And you were yes. probably the last generation to grab them. Or you're the last creative, you know, generation to grab right. them. Can you go a little bit on what we can do to win those six, uh, uh -huh. you know, those sixth graders over? But let me also preface at Graham Cracker today, a little bit of hope. There was a 35. What the hell is that? <laughs> there, there was a 35 to 45 year old woman and she had her about 15 year old son. I shit you not. She bought him a stack of two hundred dollars worth of trade paperbacks, epic collections yeah. from Graham Cracker, and it was all Marvel. So there is some hope out there. I, no, 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 no. I, I, I do. I see it. I saw it with my nephew first, my oldest nephew, and now I have two young. Uh, I have a ten-year-old and a fifteen-year-old nephew, and they. Uh, I, 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 I love sharing my comics and my trades with them just as I did about eight years ago with my, he's now 20, but you know, when he was 12 or 13, he would see the comic books movies and then he'd come over and he would want to check out my books. And I have like, a, I mean, I have, I have shelves and sh I, I basically have a virtual comic book store between this and two storage units. I have two giant storage units. So I, I can afford to share books and, and let, let my, uh, my nephew's um, interact with them. But like I said, man, one of my nephews at Thanksgiving told me flat out, like he doesn't like Star Wars. He doesn't like Marvel, DC. And he talks in a very, his own, the 10 year olds, they have their own language, you know, but I listened. Um, look, the thing with us, I, I, I'm going to tell you, Dennis, if you listen to my, I, I, I had never thought about this today, but when I was talking about the eighties and the practices that the eighties introduced, that are now being implemented across the 2000s. The reason I don't mention the 90s is the 90s was chaos. And part of that chaos was us. We were so unpredictable. We upset every apple cart, but we did it with the best of intentions because we wanted to push the envelope. But what happened is at the 2000s, the first thing they did, they wanted to crack down and constrain and control everything. The powers that be at the big two publishers wanted to micromanage everything. This is how we're going to do this. I would stand. I've told people it's, it's, I have people who were there in 2001 when I was in disguise in San Diego. I had Nick Barucci literally bump into me walking super fast. I had other people that I knew, editors, Eric Larson did not recognize me. I stood right next to the Marvel and the DC review and they're like, don't do this image stuff. None of this splashy <laughs> stuff. And I'm sitting there going, oh, damn, this is how they talk about us. Like, this is how they talk about us. And you need to draw from life, from life. Hey, man, none of the guys that I grew up loving drew from life. John, Bur I didn't know anybody that looked like a John Byrne drawing. I didn't know anybody that looked like a Jack Kirby drawing. I didn't know anybody that looked like a George Perez drawing or a Gene Colan drawing. You know, and, and, and Gene Colan, you can say, well, he had, he had some life. Yes, but he had a very stylized approach to what he did. And when I go back to my son now with anime and manga, that is the most stylized art you're going to find. And people have sharp features, sharp elbows, sharp knees, sharp, you know. But th what's happened now, today's art community wants to be told. So Dennis and Jesse and Brian, let's say we're all artists. Oh, Brian, you drew that so correctly. Well done. Oh, Dennis, that's so correct. Jesse, what a correct drawing you drew. Because the no one, no the one wants to no one wants to be criticized for doing something daring. And, you know, I was on a group today. I laughed out loud. I'm on a Facebook group, uh, Marvel Comics 1961 to 1989. And I love it.
but one guy professed his love for McFarlane's Spider-Man today. And three old fogies said, that was garbage. He drew the worst Spider-Man ever. It was, and I'm like, dude, you are so out of touch. I, I had a subscription. Spider-Man that brought Spider-Man back. You know, I had a subscription was, starting around 290. Yeah. And I remember getting that 298 folded in half yeah. by my mailman, yeah. shoved in my box. And I opened that up and I'm just like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. Holy. Well, it was a game changer. Weird. Yeah. Todd absolutely, you know, drew Spider Man in a way that no one else did. And it may not be. Uh, as I mean, I now open some of those books and I look at some of those crazy poses, but he took the approach that Spider-Man just had more bones and more elasticity and could make, which, which is great. That's the imagination of comic books, but today's artists will occasionally mimic it, but the Spider-Man they want to draw for you looks like the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man because they want to get accolades. Oh, you do that so well. Oh, you do that so well. Nobody, I don't see a lot of guys stepping out out of the box. And, you know, like any random Jack Kirby comic, you know, we'll just go there right now. What do I got here? Uh, is this one of them? Nope, that's not one of them. Hang on. Let me, let me grab one. Uh, okay, so. Aha. Okay. So we'll just get the demon. We'll just get the demon. Random grab. Okay. So here's Jack. He says, hey, everybody, welcome to my comic book. Hey, here's a splash page, okay? Guess what you're going to get next? Again, not prepared to do this. Here we go. Yeah. Oh, there you go. There's a double-page splash page. What in the hell? Remember, uh, children, th th these comics were 17 pages. So now three of 17 have been taken up with giant splashy images. And look at that immediate explosion of action. Just yeah. action, action. Elbows, arms being tossed, thrown, and let's go, let's go, let's just go to the, look at that. In the middle of it, a uh, three-quarter splash. I mean, big, bold, exciting images. I'm just going to check the last page of this issue. Um, I'm going to check the last page. Uh, so it ends with a cliffhanger, but it's, um, you know, comics were not as, it was more the Wild West, and you had creators who knew the format, who wanted to push the boundaries, there are issues of Black Panther, Captain America, The Eternals, Machine Man, Jack. You know, I bought everything Jack did when I was a kid. I like John Bur John Byrne and Frank Miller, but there was I would gr grab everything. His imagery was bold and exciting. And I'm just telling you, because I look at comics every week, I believe comics have gotten quieter. They've gotten quieter. They're trying to mimic cinema. I'm like, y I'm not. You're not going to give me what I just saw in Dune Two. None. Comics are its own art form. Comic books are their own art form. Manga well, understands this. Manga understands this better than we do right now in regards to East versus West. I truly believe that. I so, also am consuming way more manga on the regular. So that that's that's not to knock every. There's a lot of great artists out there, but it's very safe. And very few guys, because you know what, Dennis and Jesse, somebody may say, hey, man, that looked weird. We, uh oh, weird is bad. Back to my, didn't I draw this well? Didn't I draw this so well? And I'm like, dude, you, you don't think we were we knew what we were doing, breaking breaking like rules and making bigger muscles? And and you know, when people when Stephen Platt hit on Moon Knight and then he came over and did Profit for me, everybody was hyper muscled. Even Jim Lee and I would be on the phone going. Like Stephen takes musculature and proportions to another level. And to this day, if you show it to that fan base, they flip out there. Where is that? Where is that? And Stephen over time tried to draw more realistically, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and people go, why doesn't he draw like that anymore? Look at all the muscles in that back. <laughs> yeah, this and, is, I mean, yeah, amazing. But the the so, Platt Prophet was when yeah. the perfect timing of me getting uh, uh, introduced to riding up to the comic store. Sure. This is the my nostalgia era. Is this era right here? It it, it just you talking about it gives me that little shot of dope. And you, and you know what? Here, there's things about you know you in Stephen's work right there. You'll hear things that frequently people hear about me that that, that, that people say about me. 
He's over-muscled. Um, his proportions are ridiculous. He's probably nine feet tall. That girl is like <laughs> six feet nine, and five ten of that is her legs, right? But we ate that shit up. It was exciting. You know why? Because I'm going to tell you this right now. I'm never going to draw as well as John Buscema. He was one of the greatest illustrators in the history of illustration, not just comics. John Buscema was like the Michelangelo of Marvel. His Fantastic Four, his Conan, his Thor, his Avengers, beautiful proportions, women, men, faces. But if I'm going to emulate that, then I'm just John Buscema. Then I'm just being John Buscema. I tried to be me just like John Byrne was being him and Frank Miller was being him. And, and Jack Kirby was doing Jack Kirby. And it was, it, I, I've, I've said individual styles. Dennis, Jesse, I can't, when I go to the comic store, I'm not going to name names, but there's like six or seven. Uh, they all look the same to me. They all are drawing. Part of that also is the programs people are using. People are using mannequins, digital mannequins called Poser. Uh, that, that they're, they're using the same inking tools that are available in Procreate. You know, I, I, I try different things with markers and my, my kid's in Japan right now. And I have asked him to go get me a bunch of Japanese art tools because I still work on the board. Um, and, and, and again, with white paint and different effects. And I'm not saying that all these other tools aren't adv advantageous as well, but I do believe comics, I'll just say they've gotten quieter and I'm, I'll, I'll die on that hill. And I so, think we were making comics louder. That's it. We were making comics louder. Exactly. So I'm going to go a little bit backwards on yeah. what you said about connecting with the customers. Did you ever imagine all the pictures you guys took in the 90s would be part of history, its culture, its no. tradition? No. And the final part about that, how did Wizard Magazine at the time help propel people knowing who Rob Liefeld was? So, you know, it's like you said, I now know that when I put these pictures up, they are going to garner a certain attention because they are of a time that now people really romanticize. Um, I understand that my fan base does not want to hear that my favorite about my favorite period of comics, which is the 70s. They are the 90s. Wizard Magazine had a lot of behind the scenes bullshit going on. But they absolutely did push the faces of people. That uh, they were an extension because this is part of my 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 podcast is doing the eight eighties events that define the two thousands. And part of the end of that is the eighties is when Comics Journal and Amazing Heroes and Comic Scene and CBG blew up, and that's how we consumed our news. Wizard came in and made it a slicker. 100% slicker version uh, in terms of uh, pushing comics and creators. The problem with Wizard is then they were just doing agenda, 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 agenda. And it was like, well, who, who, <laughs> who's Tommy pushing this month? Who's Mikey pushing? Who's been, I mean, it was like backroom doors. And trust me, I have not gone public with stuff that I know that wizard people have told me, confirmed me, because I don't need that out there. But that kind of stuff was happening. The magazine, um, when it was at its best, 1,000% uh, made created a bond with with fans and and connected them. But I've also say, just like anything, just like any news outlet, they start abusing their power. Power corrupts and, absolutely. You know, yeah. and and uh, and and look, I I did not mind when that left and now we have these new sites and i think for the most part they're um you know they serve their purpose but you know what jesse no one's gonna sell me to you better than me via Amen. social media and 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 that's really what kind of killed wizard they can say whatever they want but the minute social media happened and i could reach out to you and you and you and you right here and I could talk to you on Twitter and I could talk to you on Facebook and I can talk to you on Instagram. And now it, it's TikTok and everything else. Uh, then I've, I've removed the middleman. And yeah, that's why a news publication, you know, I can go live with my own interview. I can share with you immediately uh, what, what I'm doing. Yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of the podcast because it's amazing. You know, it's going into four years and it really just is my passion. It absolutely is. Uh, my, I love talking comics. I love talking behind the scenes. Uh, it will not surprise anyone that the feud episodes 
do numbers that are just off the charts. But see, nobody fights anymore either. Like that's the other thing. Nobody goes after anybody anymore because the fan bases will immediately rally online in real in real time, and you'll have like real life gang wars going on, you know. And 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 so everyone's very polite, and now everyone you know just talks behind everybody else's back. Well, I think I think it. that's got that's got us to unfiltered time, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. yo, is let's do this. Wouldn't you agree, ladies and gentlemen? All right. If you want unfiltered, as best you can get, Rob Liefeld, Rob Servations is where it's at, you guys. I want to tell you guys right now, it is one of my favorite things. It's probably up there with the best content. It's, it's top three content for comic book anything on the internet, uh, social media, We're number anything. one. Uh, here's what I'm going to tell you. No, I'm number one. I am well, the I'll number give one comic book podcast. I am the number one comic book podcast and and I did not know that until last summer. And then I said, really? And then now every week I'm guilty. I check. And I have been number <laughs> one for like 40, 40 straight weeks since the fall. Like, like, like we are so so I'm really excited. And I think part of it is um I I bring you, you know, I bring facts and figures. I don't bring you myth, I don't bring you hearsay. And I never knew that sharing that that saving all my comics journal interviews, all my amazing yes. heroes. Um, all of the, cause that's the thing. I mean, wizard world would do pop pieces, right? Yes. But you didn't get a 50 page Neil Adams interview unless you were, you had comics interview or a 50 page Frank Miller or Barry Windsor Smith losing his flipping mind and calling everybody out in the industry. And you're like, Oh shit. Like he just decided he went after Jack Kirby and John B. Sema and Herb Trimp. And like Jim Starenko, it's like Barry was feeling himself that day, man. He was swinging it, and he was like, "Who else haven't I taken a shit on? Oh, let me take a shit on the image guys: McFarland, Lee, Liefeld, Amateur." Well, that's, that's why I love you. You take the piss out of everybody. There's there's no sacred cows in the Rob Liefeld universe. Well, I I, I learned a long time ago, Dennis. Everybody believes their guy is untouchable. And I told people about 15 years ago, uh, you, you actually were, you used the exact word I, I, I used. I said, show me your sacred cow and I'll show you a room of detractors. The, 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 the idea that there's one person in the business that everybody worships is just, that's a misnomer. But here, here's the best thing I can tell anybody who's watching right now, especially I'm going to speak directly to comic book creators, writers, artists, everything. Because people ask me, Rob, how is it that you take so much shit. Well, first of all, if you win a lot, you're going to get shit on a lot. I, in in real time, in one year's time, I'm going to take uh, this amazing uh, basketball player, Caitlin Clark, who I don't care if she's a girl or a boy. In this case, obviously, she's a girl, but she shoots in a supernatural manner that uh, on par with the best Steph Curry has ever been. And it takes your breath away. She's like a machine gun when she gets rolling. And she does deep threes. She came on this. She, she really got a lot of attention about 18 months ago. But now she's winning too much. And there's people have called her the greatest ever. She broke records. Uh-oh. The detractors. And now I read like websites are like, wow, the Caitlin Clark detractors are coming. All this kid does Hate is train. win game. Yep. But, but let me tell you something. Every comic book artist out there. You need to understand, you need to approach what you do as if you are an athlete because every single day on ESPN or Fox Sports West, an athlete, a baseball player, a basketball player, a football player is getting their ass reamed. They did something. They, 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 they didn't win a game. They didn't hit a clutch shot. They, 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 they struck out. Um, they dropped that pass. And what happens, because I said to my, Joy, I said to my wife, I said, imagine being this dude's family and having to listen for two weeks because they're going into a bye week, how terrible they are, how they're not clutch. They dropped a pass. Um, you know, if you're the loser in the Super Bowl, I mean, national media rips you a new one. 
we are public figures. We, we don't go through anywhere near what the athletes get in terms of getting ripped for missing, for swinging, uh, for, for striking out, for missing the clutch free throw. You know, those people and those families have to deal with a lot worse. I mean, literally, it will be like all day long, one show rolls into another and it's like, let's talk about athlete X and how he doesn't have the clutch gene. Imagine being that guy's mom, dad, sister, you know, kid oh man they're, they're sitting on my dad on national television we are not on national television getting critiqued you need to thicken up your skin and you need to understand when you're putting your work out there for public consumption not everyone will like it there is no one who everyone likes in any field i i i, I follow all the basketball michael jordan now has as many detractors at any time as he's ever had because there's no way he was the goat I have members of my own family that said, dad, he didn't play against anyone good. And I'm like, before I kill you, I want you to know, <laughs> you know, how wrong you were. But, uh, but I, I'd have to catch him to kill him. But boy, yeah. I come out like, don't you well, say that. But they, everybody wants their own heroes. And that's the other thing. This generation of combo creators, they want to be exceptional the way we were in terms of what we did. And if, before someone says, he just said he's exceptional. Bro, what we did was exceptional. You will not remove, and, and De Dennis and Jesse, Brian, I'm going to tell you, for about 15 years, I kept waiting for the next Image Comics. I thought it was conceivable that it could happen, that there would be a collection of talent, right place, right time. Holy shit, who was I kidding? That's never happening. What we did, that gets back to what Jesse was saying. I had no idea that what we did was so special. I did not. And well, now I realize, like, Wow. Like I was so fortunate to be in that um, group of guys that we were, we, we were friendly. We decided to cooperate, start this kick-ass business where image is still the third largest publisher. And, and I gotta be honest. I think if the, if the numbers are all skewed now, yeah, the numbers aren't public. I, I, I believe some months image is likely the number two publisher. I believe they are. I don't know, but you guys, I, I, I hear there's a lot of soft titles from yes. certain publishers and, and I, and, and like, there's a reason everything has a bat in it. Um, because a bat well, that's, is, that's a key thing because there's a lot of hanky panky with over ordering that I've heard of in the last yeah. several years yeah. where there are certain comic retailers on the West coast that are sitting on cases and cases of unsold products from a two right. letter from a two letter publisher because they get little deals to over order yeah. to keep these numbers up. Um, but you know, that's actually, you know, but to the victors go, the spoils, you know, is, is kind of what it, if Marvel and DC are like, if they keep pumping out images, third images, third images, third, and, and their, their number one customer, the, the publishers or the distributors are like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Image is definitely third. Huh. Then guess what? Yeah. They're going to, but, uh, yeah, but I, I, I think there's a, a notion that the, cons the consumer is also the person who's, who's judging that when they go to the counter and buy their product. Yeah. And 10 items are image and two are DC. So I think you got to measure those two tools for real sales versus wholesale. There's a big yeah. difference there. So, uh, you know, that kind of speaks to brand loyalty. And here's the deal. I'll be the guy to say it. You can quote me on it. I, I believe that. I believe that part of the system is broken. I don't believe there's brand loyalty right now. I believe every publisher and every creator, you have to earn your connection with that fan. That I go to the store, I just want a good comic. Yeah. I am, you know, here's the deal. The only franchises that I was ever fanatic about, fanatical about uh, for the longest period in my life were, were X-Men and Avengers. Uh, and then I would slide in right under there, Fantastic Four and Legion of Superheroes. At DC, it was Legion. I bought everything until it got too expansive. But I mean, I, I go way back there in early, like like 1974, I start buying Legion of Superheroes. I probably don't stop until 26 years later. But the X-Men um, and, and Avengers, I was a diehard. I would buy everything, but, but I never bought consistently Spider-Man, Batman, any of those. I would buy them when they were good. When Frank Miller left Daredevil, so did I. I was gone. I followed him to whatever he did. So there is, 
I, I, I would I follow creators more than I follow characters, and yes. I know that there are people who absolutely follow characters. Well, that's, I follow that's creators. One of the reasons, yeah, that's one of the reasons why you have a special place right now, Rob. Is you are kind of the de facto uh, historian of the comic book mythos from, let's just say, from when Stan technically left Marvel, yeah, to to the point where you're at now. Um, you know more of this than ninety percent of the people buying comic books now, and you have the voice and the platform to share it and the uh, charisma the, and to the do charisma. It. You know, when you look at when you look at the history of the entire history of comics, nobody in that golden age had the charisma to be a Stan Lee until Stan Lee became Stan sure. Lee. Sure, no, for sure. And then, and now that we've lost Stan, everybody was like, "Oh, Joe Casada is going to do it. Look, he's on Colbert. Oh, look, Todd's going to do it. He's he's got a, a Facebook Live show." But when it all comes down to it, Rob has Rob observation and Rob has the history and the receipts to back it up. Okay, well, talk about I that, please. So, so I don't agree. I, I agree that I have an outlet. Um, I am certainly not a lot of people's cup of tea. But see, here's the deal, Dennis and Jesse. I've always known that, and I don't care. Like, Damn. I'm not trying to woo over when people. Some if there's a hater, I just go. I identify you as a hater and move on with your life. Have a good life. I don't need. We don't need to know each other. I'm <laughs> certain that's where my my wife and her sisters. They're like they want everyone to like them in in life, and I'm like. Fuck it. I don't care if you like me. I never have. Like, I, I'm my own brand. But when it comes to Rob's observation, I have been responsible. I have shared comic book history in the way that it happened. And there are a lot of myths. I, I've talked to people. Like, people double down on bullshit. And they, they can't substantiate it. And when you press them for receipts, they'll generally vanish. But I will bring with you a fact. I, I will bring with you an interview, a fact especially when it comes to any of my dealings with Marvel or Image Comics, memos, uh, faxes, which remember everybody said those faxes were going to disintegrate and turn it in. All my faxes are that are 35 years old are still on wax paper and I can see them. They didn't disintegrate into dust. You know, I bought the same cheap paper from Office Max as everybody else. Yeah. But uh, no, I look, my here, here's what it is. It's not charisma. It's I have the comics excite me. And yes. that's what unites all of us right now on this show. We are excited about comics. I love to talk about comics. I love to tell, you know, if my nephew tells me that he liked Watchmen, I ran in and got him Miracle Man. And I yep. said, I want you to have this. This is going to bring out a different visceral reaction. I said, I believe this. It is my opinion that Miracle Man is superior it is the best thing Alan Moore's ever read. You may feel differently, but I, I, and he's like, I've never heard of this. I said, take it. And he's like, he, he just calls me Rob. I, I, he's my nephew. He goes, Rob, wow, that <laughs> book blew my mind. I didn't, I'd never heard of it. And you know, and at that point we are like comic book evangelists, right? So you're just trying to spread the word. And, yeah. and I love, you know, he didn't know a miracle man. He did not know what incredible dynamite I was giving him. He didn't know how beautiful the art and the storytelling. I mean, the thing that still creeps me out about Miracle Man, the thing that still creeps me out about Miracle Man is after he transforms, his wife never wants him to go back to being the regular guy. She just wants to have sex with Miracle Man. And when you read that, I read it when I was probably 17, and you're like, this makes me feel a certain way. Like, it's, it's adult. It's kind of like... She's like, no, 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 no. Can you just stay in that form? And I mean, it's, it's like there's real, like some emotional stuff going on there and some adult stuff. And uh, and I remember Jim Valentino and I would go to the comic store and get the conclusion of the Miracle Man versus Kid Miracle Man story uh, yeah. with, with, with uh, where, where, where they were just tearing apart the city and poking each other's eyes out. It was, to this day, it's one of the most violent superhero, super god confrontations ever but also it took forever to come out there was long delays but you know what it was the good good old jeff Loeb who told me robert doesn't matter if it's late it's gonna get collected at one point and then it'll be collected forever and it's yeah. like sometimes you wait a little longer to get it right because i don't know if you guys remember but it was when i was in retail i was that kid 
who there was long delays between Dark Knight two and three, and then three and four. Do you guys remember that? Yeah, and sure. Where's Dark Knight? Where's <laughs> Dark Knight? Well, I'm like, no, Dark Knight's not coming in this week. Thanks. Uh, no, Dark Knight. And people were, is the new Dark Knight? In? The new Dark Knight's not in. Um, there was a local show here in Orange County in the summer of '86. The only publisher that showed up was DC, and their reps were tied up explaining to everyone when the last issue of Dark Knight was going to ship because it was like, you know, but but it speaks to how great it was. And you know what? So that was 1986. For 30 plus years, we've opened the, the, the we get it collected after the fact. We were there to, I agree with what you said earlier, Dennis, experiencing cliffhangers in real time is such a shock. Um, but once it's collected, you're like, hey, I don't, I don't remember being frustrated that it took three more months. What I know is it's brilliant, and and I've had it for thirty years now. So I mean, it, it's, it's like I skipped Breaking Bad the first time through, sure, and then I binged it, and I got to those last six episodes, and I'm I'm talking to all my friends like every like you know every hour. I'm like, how did you guys? How did you guys go six months without? That's this? it. You know, and so I I understand it from both sides. Yes. But it, I would have torn my hair out not knowing what he, those last six episodes took, in, yeah. took a year. We just know? finished We just finished uh, this excellent uh, show on Apple called Masters of the Air, which talks about our, the, you know, our, our Air Force in World War II. And Joy and I watched it every single week, and the cliffhangers on those were nailed by it. You're like, wait, it's over? What's happening? And then you know, our friends are like, oh, we just watched all 10 episodes in one night, and we're like, we don't know what that's like, yeah. but also like House of Dragon. Yeah, the first season of House of Dragon di- emotionally stirred me. I screamed at the table. I hated the bad guys. I and and it's going to be two years that I've waited. But after that first House of Dragon, I was so inspired. I drew more work. I was more productive because I had that. And and in today's market, it's like, you know, two two years later, we're going to pick up the story, and we just accept it. It's how things are now. And I'm not really sure how this applies. The bottom line is, look, I just love comic books. I love I love the medium. And and if I can share my passion with other people, and that's what I didn't expect. I was I was mumbling into this microphone for the first few months, not realizing anybody was listening. And then when the pandemic listed li- lifted and I went to comic stores and I started doing um, signings at stores. Cause I really haven't been to conventions in over three years. Right. I started doing it directly with stores. I would go and say, look, I'm going to have a book that I'll sign for free for everybody. And then everything else here, if they want to buy it, they do. But it's, it's like, if I'm going to be there, I don't want the pressure to be on them to buy anything. We'll sign one book for free. And, and at least you're getting a free comic, a free interaction. And all anybody wanted to talk to me about was the, was the podcast. And I literally was like, what's going on here? Like everyone would talk to me. And I don't know what happened. I can't explain it. I'm, I'm glad it has the audience it does. And I'm glad that I can hang with guys like you and, and, and talk comics anytime. So thank you for inviting me. Is there anything else we want to wrap up any more like end of show stuff? I just want to say one thing, folks, what you're seeing with Rob right now, when he's on stage talking to people, it's like amped up. 10 more times. Where, where do you get the energy when you're talking to uh-huh. those massive groups? Nervous. I'm just nervous. Jesse, yeah. it's all nerves. It's all d- and Mountain Dew. <laughs> that, uh, and, and if you believe the lies, all of the drugs I do, yeah. right? My, my, <laughs> my publicist told me, you have to start making jokes. People, and there's a couple people who are like, oh, that guy. I'm going to tell you right now, I have never, ever I don't want illegal substances. I don't want, or, and, and I don't like foreign substances. I tried to drink and be a cool kid in high school and I spit it all up. And I'm, I'm famous for saying, Dennis, if, if all alcohol tasted like Mountain Dew, I would be in AA right now. Okay. But, but I, that stuff tastes like shit to me. Like <laughs> beer and liquor. And, and so, and, and it's just natural energy. It's natural nerves, Jesse. It is there. There you go, Jesse. You just that is the nectar of the gods, the perfect formula, the perfect formula. And and Subway knew it, which is why they're going to all Pepsi products. They're like, see a Coke. Um, but here's the deal: it's just nerves. I don't want to let people down. And also, Jesse, some of my favorite creators. 
I can't be more direct than this. I would go to creation conventions. I would go to San Diego in 1982. I'd be in the room and I won't say the creator, but here's the energy they'd give. Yes, well, <laughs> what I was thinking when constructing that storyline, I was really thinking of how Shakespeare would have approached it and possibly how I would construct it in a sonnet. And I'm like, fucking sonnet? Like, <laughs> I want to know when Wolverine's going to kill somebody next. Like, come on, entertain. It was so many comic creators are boring as shit, okay? Yeah. They're super boring. Their work is good. So if I'm going to ask you to come and see me in a room, lately I – I haven't done it in three years, but I will stand on the chair now. Like yeah. I just stand on the chair. That's the other thing in my signings. If I do go out in public and I do sign, I stand the whole time because we have a lot of books and people, we want them to take their time. And sometimes people take 15 minutes deciding what to buy. And, and I don't want them to feel rushed, but I also want the, the, the people I'm standing with you. I don't, I think it would be such a, I'm sitting there on my recliner. Hey, everybody. Sorry. You're waiting for two hours. No, I want you to know my knees hurt too. I'm standing. You're standing. Rob. And, and, and the people, they, they've seen this. Rob, there's one question that I ask every artist or yeah. writer um, that comes on the show. Uh, I do a, I have a list. It's a living okay. list that I add constantly. It's called the okay. Beyond Wednesdays Comic Creator First List. It's listed all right. in all of our stuff. For you, I have a couple uh, posts. Yes. yes. First published work, Megaton number five. Is that true? That's correct. And I also was wondering, is there anything that you ever sent in like a drawing to as before you ever got started in comics that got published or anything like that? Because I know you had no. a pinup in Boris the Bear. Was That's there anything? Correct. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the thing about the Boris the Bear, that was drawn, you know, uh, anybody in comics retail, because when I worked at Tustin Tunes and Toys, uh, I would, you know, Friday was new comic book day back then. And uh, some and Wednesdays, you'd get a little a little action. But Thursdays were really always super slow. That Boris the Bear is on the back of a backing board. I drew it in markers at the register. And from the store, I decided I'd, I'd, I'd send it in. They never told me they were printing it. I pulled the Boris the Bears out of the box to put them on the shelf a few months later. And I'm like, what the hell? That's my Boris the Bear. They had wow. just printed it. But, you know, there's a four-page uh, Little Red Riding Hood story that Dark Horse commissioned from me that I penciled uh, where she meets a werewolf. Uh, a, a gentleman named Steve Matson. he worked at Dark Horse at the time. That is a great unpublished story i have xeroxes of the four or five, maybe five pages but it, it never saw print there's still stuff i did out there that did not see print that uh, like i look at that werewolf story it's as good as anything you're going to get in a comic book today i i was looking at it in my um in my files the other day but no that bear boris the bear is really a funny story how that came about but uh megaton comics was a real friend to up-and-coming creators and they still are gary carlton has a great company. Megaton Comics are fun. Yeah. Uh, a, a guy, a, a, a talent I know named Ron Williams uh, does a ton of work for them. He's kind of been a godsend for them because he's fast. He meets his deadlines. He's got a cool style and, uh, and, and, and he's been doing a ton of work with them. So it's, it's just, you know, I've, I've met a lot of great, great, great people uh, in, in comics and mo from, for the most part, I have stayed on good terms with every single um person that, that, that I that, that I was friendly with. We may grow apart and not see each other for long periods of time, but we still have these early career bonds, you know? So. Well, and that's why, that's what I wanted to say as we could wrap this up, Rob. Um, you and I have been friends for only about 15 years. 2009 yeah. Vegas Retailer Summit. Sure. And the thing I've loved about you is you call the shots and the, the the fouls and the balls and the strikes almost as solid as I do. You're you're actually a little bit more politically correct when it comes to burning bridges. There it um, is. Yeah. Yeah. I have to be. I have to be. 
Yeah, no, exactly. And I don't I don't begrudge that. But yeah. I remember the one time you had my back is when I went after Dan over at DC and and DC's decisions to do um, this retailer kind of BS. Yeah. And you were like, this guy gets it. And I just want to say, brother, I understand that you get it. And that's one of the reasons why I appreciate you coming on here, um, you know, for kind of our first month worth of shows. Sure. Um, and uh, many more years between us, brother. Well, I hope so. Look, I've known you and Jesse a long time. And Jesse has always been in my corner. And uh, and, and I've always been happy to, to work with Jesse, work with you, talk with... I mean, again, you guys, I, I said tonight, like, in case people didn't know who you were, I mean, I told people these are two long-standing legends in the retail business. As I put out to social media, you know, these are... You guys know your shit. And you've been... And you're going to be selling comics when I retire. I believe that. Um, I, I do. But uh, but but look, the, the truth of the matter is, Dennis and Jesse and Brian, I am blessed to draw comics. There are days I do not leave the house. Um, uh, if I don't go out and get something to eat outside, I will not have left the house today. Uh, I, I and it's it's I I I don't have the stress of 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 going and punching a clock. I get to create comics. I drew comics for Marvel today. I drew comics for me. I filled up pages with drawings and inked them and scanned them and looked at work that was coming coming in from different colors that I work with. Uh, I talked to publishers. It's just like, it's a good life. Comic books has really been a good life. I've been able to put my kids through, you know, all of their schooling, meet their needs, assist them. Uh, I'll, 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 I'm, I'm going to be married, married 29 years this summer. Uh, I just, I just try and really look on the bright side and, and, and it's just, it, it's a, it's a blast being able to do this. It really is. And it, it wasn't a side hustle. Cause when I, uh, you know, when we first got in our peers that w some of them were angry that we were becoming more popular than them. And, and, and you see it in sports teams again, when the guy who's been the starter for 10 years is like this hot shot is taking my glory. And you, you see that, that some of them tried to put out that we got, this is my favorite thing ever that we got into comic books for money. Really? Did I get into comic books in 1986 for the millions of dollars that were available? Pretty sure it was a bunk page rate, right? But, but uh, no one was getting rich. You know, you had to work to sell your books and maybe if you made some royalties, but uh, that's the thing that's always – Todd McFarlane did not get into comics to get rich. Neither did Jim Lee, neither did Rob Liefeld or any of my group. We just love it, and we still do. Um, I, I, it is weird, though, Dennis. The one thing I will say, I'm super – like, as our legends keep passing, Stan passes, Neil Adams, George Perez, Jack Kirby over the years. Like, I was fortunate to be in their homes – to hang out with these guys, to have meaningful dinners, socialize, you know, uh, like, like sitting at Jack Kirby's dinner table with him and Roz and, and, and just hearing great stories or, and then later going into the drawing room and standing at the table that were fantastic Four and X-Men. And he, he drew captain America and black Panther, all the seventies stuff, definitely the new gods and commandy and, 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 and his, his bicentennial captain America work, was all drawn in that room, you know, in Southern California. Uh, so, so not not the X-Men and the Avengers of the 60s, but all the, because he did so many covers. You guys remember the 70s, Avengers, Defenders, Fantastic Four. He was so prolific. And you're just like, I was in the room where it happened with what I believe the most important guy in the history of comics was. And, and it, it is a privilege. And I'm just so thankful that I got into comics when I did, because I, I, I would have missed that. I would have missed getting to know those guys because, again, they're gone, you yeah. know? And it's, uh, it, it really is, it, I mean, it, 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 it's scary because um, soon m me and my group are going to be the old guys, and, and that's weird. Yeah. That's just freaking weird. But, hey, well, thank you for having me tonight. Thank you for having me. Rob, we are just as thankful you, that you got started in comics then, too. And thank you for everything you do, man. We appreciate you. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Jesse, take care. Dennis. Brian, great to see you. Have a good one. Adios. That was Rob Liefeld, ladies and gentlemen. One of the best. I mean, yep. that was awesome. Doesn't get much better than that.
So thank you, Rob, for that. Great, great interview with him. But listen, you guys, we're not done. We still got no. half a show to go. We uh, do. So um, we got another I, I think guest. The great thing about Rob is when you put your questions together for Rob and you're like, I'm going to be interviewing Rob. Am I even going to get a question? And yeah. so I wrote all my questions. I was going to be able yeah. to ask Rob. And you can see my blank. My page is blank. And I'm like, yeah, oh, I, 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 I started attempt. writing down notes last night when I was talking to Brian. And Brian's like, what questions are you going to ask? What? I'm like, uh, well, uh, maybe that's a place to end. No, uh, wait, yep. hold on. Maybe I can insert that. No, no, he's still talking, and I'm not interrupting Rob. Uh, okay, I really want to bring that one up because he's talking about it right now. You know, and that's that's what you get with Rob. Yep. You know, it if is. you get a word in edgewise, you better take it because Rob's going to keep going with it. He is the he is podcast quarterback Tom Brady level. Yeah, just he has the ball. It's going to go somewhere. Just block and allow him to run. Yep. Yep. And well, in, in, in reality, go ahead. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, well, Jesse, go ahead because we, we got another guest we're going to bring up, and I'm going to let you introduce him once you're done saying okay. what you were going to say. So well, I, I want to say, oh, go ahead, Jesse. I was just going to say, pull up that picture of me and Rob real fast. All right. If you still have it. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things with uh, Life Phil that I've been very fortunate to. Uh, be able to do with Rob over the years. That's me and Rob Liefeld and 114 other creators breaking two Guinness Book of World Records. And he's always been the guy, even though his persona is this individual guy most of the time, he is a big community guy in the comic book industry. There's never been anything in the 15, whatever, how many years I've known him where he has said, oh no, Jesse, I, I just don't have time for that. If it's about the community, he really jumps in. So it's been a very, very, uh, uh, a cool thing to have him on the show with the three of us and hanging out tons of people watching in, in the comment section and watching the show as well. So well, but everybody in the I comment this section, is best, this is our best uh, live chat yep. to, to date, right? Well, everybody in the sec and that's watching right now knows how much of a bucket list that is for me to bring Rob on the channel. It's always been something that, uh, you know, I kind of had that I really wanted to achieve. I look at really look at Rob as uh, in a different light, ever since Rob Servation started. It's it's so um, uh, awesome to hear him talk excitedly about comics, and that's what he does. You can hear him. He is just excited about comics, talking about the comics he loves, and that, to me, is the most important thing, and that's why I love Rob Liefeld so much. But listen, you guys, we love to talk about local comic shops and the guys who are in the trenches in here, which, of course, include uh, artists and writers, but they also include the guys who are opening stores and running stores, and we have a great guest that we're going to bring on. Jesse, why don't you go ahead and uh, bring bring up, uh, introduce him. Right. The next guest we have up is, is just a innovator in the comic book of in industry, someone who has pivoted. Sometimes I'll see him pivot, like he'll say something in the beginning of the day, and he's already pivoted to something else midday, uh, and that's what you want to see. He's a very well-respected person, very good on selling product on very a lot of platforms. And I think most people, when you hear uh, the, the store name, you think culture and tradition. So here we go. Here is our next guest. Uh, honor to have him on. Hi, guys. How you doing? <laughs> Steve Great. from Third Eye Comics. So, awesome. Steve, uh, so we booked you, I think, two weeks ago. Jesse was starting to talk to you about two weeks ago. Um, yeah. And I just want to say something right right off the bat, man. I, I wanted to make sure you were cool to go on with uh, everything that happened in your hometown uh, you. last night. And I just wanted to make sure everybody, uh, you know, puts their uh, thoughts uh, and prayers with you guys. Um, in Baltimore, yeah. So if you don't realize, Steve's from Baltimore. He's kind of a Baltimore legend. Um, and anytime you think of Baltimore... You're, now you think of Penguin Random House, but before that, Diamond, before that, you know, uh, Steve Jeppy and Third Eye. It, it's kind of like the, the litany of what you think of when you think of retailing in Baltimore. So Thank I you. wanted to make sure you were good with that. that. No. Yeah, luckily, uh, all the friends and family are OK and all, but it's a terrible yeah. thing that happened. So, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look at this store. Look yeah, at this. Beautiful. Store. Yep. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, Steve, I started uh, this content thing uh, 
about five or six years ago with a, a content creator that uh, I respect immensely. He kind of uh, guided me a lot in what I do. And his name is Brian Wood at Simple Man's Comics. And oh, okay, right on. Yeah, yeah I and know Brian. Yes, Brian talks about Third Eye and holds Third Eye in such high regard that uh, I live on the far on the, in the West Coast. And one of my things that uh, I did the first time I went to the East Coast, which was go to go to Baltimore, was I had to go to Third Eye Comics. And, oh, um, man, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, cool. That's so, awesome. <laughs> so we're really glad to have you on here. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's no, awesome thank you. I'm, you. I'm flattered. I'll have to apologize if I'm awkward. I'm not on camera often, so. <laughs> Don't worry about it. We're you all awkward. Have to forgive me. <laughs> and, and we wanted to take the pressure off you by just having Rob Liefeld on before. Yeah, no, that helps. So took all the pressure off. No yeah. worries. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like everybody's probably like, all right, time to tune out. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's like having Elton John open for you. You know, you're like, yeah. you're not yeah. gonna, you're not gonna bring that to a better level. So you know, just yeah. relax and go with it. Cool. Uh, start off with your origins. I mean, just how did how? You know, it's kind of funny. We all start off as collectors, right? As comic book collectors. I started in 1982 as a 12 year old working at the friendly neighborhood comic book store in Las Vegas. Where did you start and in the comic book world and then into the industry world? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I um, I started going to a couple shops um, near where, where I was when I was a kid, um, you know, Heroes and Landover Mall and um, I, uh, I ended up shopping at uh, my local shop, which was in Bowie, Maryland. Um, I was in there every week, you know, like I didn't know what I was doing. And eventually I had a good comic guy that was like, hey, I held that book for you. I pulled it out of somebody's box. You know, it was X-Men Alpha and um, or yeah, Age of Apocalypse, X-Men Alpha. And um, I was like, I was floored. And like this guy, like he got to know like what I liked and, you know, he'd be like, oh, you should check this out or tell me about Frank Miller. Or tell me about like, you know, Mike Magnolia. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it, it was, it was a really cool place to go. And, um, I shopped there, you know, all throughout my teenage years. And then, um, you know, I was working a couple of jobs that weren't great when I was about 18 or 19. And, um, the, uh, the store had changed owners. Um, and then they, uh, they were looking for help and, um, you know, they hired me on, I started working there when I was about 18, almost 19 years old and, um, worked there till I was in my early twenties, about 23 or 24 um so was this in the days before you got paid in comic book bag and boards <laughs> or did you actually get paid i got i got i got real pay but it wasn't we're not a lot oh, oh my gosh <laughs> but a sick discount <laughs> yeah there you go but um but so, yeah yeah and um yeah. i did that till i was in my early 20s so it's about 22 23 and worked a couple more jobs that weren't that great for me and you know um I, uh, I quit those and started selling my collection and delivering pizzas and working at the comic shop again um, and um, opened Third Eye when I was 26. And um, that was 2008, and I haven't stopped since. I love it. I'm real thankful that I get to do it. Um, so one of the questions that we ask uh, our guests when we have them on for the first time um, is – to tell us what a comic book store is. Now, we all know a comic book store, first and foremost, is a place that sells comics. But what, other than that, what is a comic book store to you? I mean, it's, um, you know, I think it's a place where no matter where you're from or who you are, you feel good. You know what I mean? Everybody's into the same thing. And, you know, like, it's just, um, you know, when I was a kid, I was a nerdy kid and I felt, I felt like I found my spot, you know, and that's how I like um, I like our stores to feel. That's how I think any good comic shop feels is, you know, you just feel at home. Comic shops yeah. where you feel at home, you know. Yeah, they're they're welcoming. Uh, yeah. Anybody's allowed. Uh, it's one thing that I talk about as a lot. A lot is, you know, a lot of a lot of us who who grew up being part of comics. You know, there's a little bit of us that's that you know kind of that that shy nerdy loner kind of you know thing you know and, and we're not all terrible in that but we have little parts of it that and we're an yeah. awkward bunch we're 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 a real awkward bunch and when you walk into a comic book shop especially a place that feels welcoming that has that comic book shop smell um you yeah. can hear the people talking it's it's such a uh warm like feeling you feel safe in a comic book it's shop good energy yes. yeah yeah yeah, it's good energy. I like that. And that's that's it for me, you know. I mean, that's um that's what I liked when I was going to shops as a kid and I just 
I like that to be, that's what it is for me, you know? One of the things that uh, I see a lot in the chat is talking about third eye and ratio comic sales. Uh, where a place, uh, what somebody said in the chat, a place where you can still get a ratio comic for ratio <laughs> prices. And yeah. um, uh, talk about uh, selling new comics and, on, uh, and uh, being a store that sells uh, for new comic book day and, and how that's kind of changed over the years. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we, um, we never stretch for incentive variants. Um, we, um, we always basically, uh, we qualify organically. Um, so basically, um, you know, I mean, if we're like two or three copies away, we might stretch, you know what I mean? But like, we're never trying to like order a hundred or something we can't sell just to get that one in 100. So for us, it's fair to sell those at ratio. You know what I mean? And that's why we, we do the one in 25s at 25 bucks because, you know, we're, 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 we're going to move those copies. Um, but, um, for new comics, I mean, like it comes down to this. It's all dependent on the market and like how the market's going for comics. And, um, you know, we carry a lot of different things at Third Eye. We sell a lot of different things. Comics are my favorite thing to sell, like bar none. Like that's what I'm really good at. That's what I know. So when the market's good and there's quality content coming out, like I'm, I'm like all about it, man. That's what I'm about. You know what I mean? Um, and it really is dependent on that kind of market. And I'm real excited right now because it feels like this year, especially, is like ramping up to be like a fantastic year for yes. content. Like I'm really yes. pumped. Yeah. Well, the one thing I noticed with you, you're you're looking at your stores and you're looking at space. You look at I, when I look at your stores, you really design your space around a a, a plethora of genres. How do those yeah. other genres come into play? Is that something that you're kind of saying? Listen, we're then do this. We're then try this how long do you try something before you actually make the decision if it's then stay and then also how do you make that decision for as many stores that you have now opened uh how is that work in your mindset is that a daily thing or is that a quarterly thing yeah you know it's wild man um so you mean like all the different categories like, yeah. you know, like the records and the stuff yeah. like that sure so, so like i mean like um everything is either <clears throat> like if you know about it and we keep carrying it, it means it worked. If you don't know about it, it means it didn't work. I mean, it's all, it's all a test. You know what I mean? So like records is, a, I'll, I'll use that as an example. Um, everything like, I'm like, okay, cool. You know, we have people coming in and they're buying comics that, you know, I think would appeal to people who would get into like, you know, some zines. So like, you know, we carry something like Henry and Glenn, or we carry like, you know, like some of the like, like punk comics. Hell yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the hip hop covers Marvel did and things like that. And um, and I'm like, OK, cool. You know, like our customers have good taste in music. Um, <laughs> you know, they want it there. You know, they're buying the, the comics about the metal bands and the, the hip hop covers and all that. And um, and I'm like, that's cool. I'm like, let's, let's try something else. So then you throw a Wu-Tang shirt on your shirt section or a Misfits shirt on your shirt, shirt section. And um, and then you see people buy those and you're like, OK, cool. Um, let, let me try this. And then you, you get a little bit of like, say records and, um, you, um, you know, you, you put those out and you start kind of seeing how people respond to it and you just kind of expand it and it kind of grows from there. So, um, we just opened third eye music and video, which is, um, like our, um, our record store. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know if you pay attention to me at all, Steve, but, uh, two years ago I opened a new concept store. Um, no new comics. I rack, 80s and 90s comics as if they were new oh, i do cool. discount tier pricing i sell beanie babies and hot wheels just for the entire 90s aesthetic we're going to sell pogs cool. real soon hell yeah um, so after i tested that business model which i call the cracker barrel business model you you just call it a comic shop and no matter what it is it's just a comic shop you know like a general store in a cracker barrel yeah i decided to do the same thing with a record store because i had so much vinyl so much physical media and I wanted to have a place where I didn't have to cram anime and records into my comic book store. So I opened a second store in the same mall right next door to it. That's awesome. And you're kind of following the same trajectory that I am. Yeah. Which I, I, I love. Uh, <laughs> I opened it a year ago and it's already bringing, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes it surpasses the comic book store that's already established for a year. But I don't think a lot of people in our space um understand that crossover market they don't understand like i remember people bitching to david gabriel 
Why are you keep doing these hip hop variants? These things suck. You don't realize there are, you know, what I call way hipper than you uh, customers that understand a DMX Wolverine variant yeah. that you don't get. I will take their money. I will take your customer. And how many new customers came in because they may, may have seen that or somebody showed them it and they said, oh, wow, those are those are super cool. Or, or customers that might not have been buying as much at the time. And I, you know. I ordered 100 uh, off of just spec of uh, The Weeknd Presents Starboy. Yeah. And, and I remember... Like when that thing hit and he announced a second print on one of the Marvel retailer groups, and they're all like, Why are you going a second print? Nobody bought this. I'm like, dude, I have seen faces and, and, and I'm not trying to generalize. I saw faces that I had not seen in a comic book store before. You know? And it was because they wanted that book. No, I mean we um we, we just we love it. We love we love having like like all kinds of cool stuff like that. I mean, like it's um you know, just having like stuff kind of just, uh, it's just good, you know? And if something works, we, we just do more with it and we just kind of put more stuff out there. And if it doesn't work, then we just kind of, you know, we don't do it. You know, I mean, I tried to do arcade cabinets that didn't work. <laughs> Actually, it's hilarious. I You're have arcade cabinets and they don't sell. Yeah. Yeah. I so, thought it was a no brainer. Yeah. yeah the arcade so I started off were, with were, were two machines, two pinballs, right? Yeah. I now have 70 pinballs in the uh, store and about 25 cabinets. And so it's really, it's, it's funny when I hear it doesn't work for someone, it's really, okay, where you are and, you know, how passionate you are about it in that particular thing. Obviously, you have tech issues and all that. We just bought the new That's Jaws what today. Us with the tech yeah. Issues. Yeah, 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 the tech issues. We just bought Jaws thing. today, showed up, it wasn't in the box. Yeah. I'm like, where's the box? Well, the, there is no box. I'm like, well, I don't want it if it doesn't have the box. Why would you deliver it? But it's the funny part is the whole point is your your pivoting and your transition sales are very important. Do you throw turn rates into all this stuff, or is this yeah. just cash register, or do you use that turn rate formula? We use the turn rate formula. I mean, we um, you know, we and we 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 ramp stuff up based off of like we we follow the trends of how things are moving in terms of like, you know, how quickly they're turning around and stuff like that. I mean, um, you know, we 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 tend to ramp it up a bit. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, the thing for us is like, the comic book market is always it's weird, right? There's always like a cycle where basically you'll have like two years where it's real strong and it's killer and everything is just boom, 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 boom. And then you'll have two years where it sucks, you know, and there's not a lot coming out and there's good books, but there's not as many good books. And, um, do you blame the publishers or the I'll blame anybody? Or, well, no, just, but you've got to have, you've got to have a cause and effect. It's the, it's not the customers. Cause I think, no, no, no. I, I just think it's the nature of the beast, you know, like it's gonna, there's, I think there's, um, I think what it is honestly is there's transition points. And I think that, um, your 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 main core demographic for weekly comics um typically is going to respond to whatever um they resonated the most with when they were about 12 to 15. Yep. um and um i think that there's always like a weird period between the boom and the bust where basically you get a point where like um there will be um there'll be a period where there's like an, a, a transitionary period and i think that those down periods are those transitionary periods where basically like the publishers are trying to catch up to whatever the next generation is that's coming in and um i think that's what we just saw over the last couple of years like i think that we've kind of we're moving to um you know like a more content driven market now um whereas we've been in a collector driven market and i like both markets i like the collector driven market i like the content driven market but i think for the last five or six years it's been more of a collector driven market yeah because that's what resonates with people who were you know 12 to 15 in 1997 1998 <laughs> Um, but now with like Ultimate Spider-Man stuff, like I think we're moving towards like a more content. Right, but but he, hear me out on this one, and I don't. I, I know not everybody's going to agree with me, especially not in the chat. But I think it's like driving long distance for these publishers, and once they realize they get a straightaway, they're not pushing higher. They they hit cruise control. Maybe it's five miles over. Maybe it's 10 miles over. They hit cruise control and they let it go. And they don't right. realize they're, they're starting to go uphill. 
at a certain point. Like you, you, yeah. you've tapped out where where uh, I'll throw this out there. You've tapped out where something is, is killing the children is going to be. You know, you're right. not pushing that envelope. And at a certain point, it starts to come down before uh, you've juiced it up and you've already lost the momentum from that. And I think that, like, if you had seen that you needed an ultimate Spider-Man, you would have saw it after uh, Renew Your Vows was hitting hard. Right. And we would have had ultimate, this ultimate Spider-Man four years ago, five years ago. But it wasn't until they started running out of gas and they're they're going uphill and the and the fans have slowly tapered off and they don't care enough about this little storyline or that little storyline. They don't care about Mary Jane getting stuck in an alternate universe where she has two kids and you definitely took a sucker punch. And then you're like, oh, we have to get we have to get in there and, and win these guys back. Oh wow. Orders are huge for Amazing Spider-Man. Quick. Or Ultimate Spider-Man, quick! Ultimate Black Panther, Ultimate War, Ultimate Invasion, Ultimate, Ultimate, Ultimate. Oh, uh, it's like, guys, you have to pace this stuff out. And I love Marvel. I'm a total Marvel slacker. Yeah. But y- this should have been spread out over a nice year to two years, like the original Ultimate should have been. Henry, I, I, Henry in the chat says, uh, "How do we get the younglings into comic books?" That's a million dollar question, and it is the million dollar question. It's the question that we ask all the time. And I got to be honest here; I don't Dog think man. it's possible anymore. Uh, I, not not the style of comic books that we love. And just let me let me let me just co- talk about this real quick. Not at least the comic style that we love that we grew up with, with comics from the the seventies, eighties, nineties, you know, early two thousands. I think that. The, the the with social media and everything that's happened technology wise and you kind of hit it Dennis about video games and then you know um, uh, the way kids learn nowadays it, it isn't through a book it's through a tablet you know it's that type of stuff and the only way to get a lot of these kids into buying these things I feel like it is that manga stuff it is the dog man stuff and that is what they're enjoying I just feel like they don't that that the comic the, the the comic art form that we know it that we love today is not hitting it. At least I'm hundred percent positive that what these the two big publishers are putting out nowadays is definitely not it. Well I I said it last week when we were talking to Dirk Manny. Uh I saw it firsthand. Dirk handed those two girls his little Cthulhu. That was the first time they had touched a comic book. Their dad was dragging them around a comic book show we need to get more free comics into the hands of more children. And if that takes, if, if, here's the thing, Scholastic doesn't want us there. Scholastic wants to sell Dog Man and Captain Underpants to the, those kids. We need to get into those schools and we need to have an all ages Spider-Man. We need an all ages little Miles Morales. We need an all ages little Batman, you know, or, or whatever the, the story is we need those free to put in their hands just like a scholastic book fair we can retrain these kids to read a comic book but it takes a dedication it takes you know the the wisdom and the know-how it takes free comic book day to be actually free for retailers and we'll do it we'll do it five times bigger if you give it to us but we're, if we have to pay for it you're only going to do you're going to you're going to be at pocket states stakes with most retailers i mean steve what do you think on that um you mean like getting the kids in the comics or just free comics or what all of it all of that all of it i mean we saw a lot of kids comics um we saw a lot of comics to kids um and um i i mean like it's everything you know i mean like sonic sonic sells like mad for me um plants versus zombies minecraft um all the like kind of minecraft spinoffs like the um oh god 8-bit warrior stuff like that um like like it's um i think the biggest trick is really just kind of if you if you have your stuff if you if you want to hit what they're what they're going to go for so like you know a kid isn't going to come in right off the bat and know that they want to read spider-man until a cool spider-man thing comes out we sold a lot of spider-verse stuff to kids we sold a lot of those like um the marvel uh digest sized um like 12.99 books those are great you know we saw we saw a ton of those um well, that whole Art Balthazar DC uh, run at it was good, but they were all seven ninety five. 
right. I needed, I, I felt like I needed a, hey, get me one I could buy for 25 cents and I can get for free. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I, I we like giving out free comics. I mean, like, I'd love to have like free samplers for that kind of stuff. Um, I think that stuff's great, you know. I mean, but we'll, we'll do that with like Overstock, you know. I mean, you know, I bought a bunch of Pokemon comics once and I still have them. And I just, I've been giving those things out for years, you know, because kids always love Pokemon, you know. But, um, but I mean, you know, it's just, it's just getting out there and just kind of like, you know, having the stuff that they're going to want to grab and, you know, it's, um, it's tricky, you know, it's, it's tricky, but I mean, I think consistency is the big thing. Um, mm. my, my one thing that I wish that they did do with those Marvel, like, um, uh, digest size books is, um, the format's great. It's the perfect size. You know, it's, it's very similar to manga. It looks like manga. The price is great. You know, I mean like 12 99, that's great. You know, you get a good thick book for that. I wish they would have just done them like Miles Morales, Spider-Man volume one, Miles Morales, Spider-Man volume two, because that's what um that's the success of invincible you know what i mean invincible has tremendous success with the the manga crowd because it, it it's formatted like manga you know like you come in you you see the the show and you're like i can get invincible book one i can get invincible mm -hmm. book two it's the same thing if somebody sees demon slayer on crunchyroll or whatever they're gonna come in and be like i got demon slayer book one i got demon slayer book two you know um but those weird like subtitles where they're trying to kind of like just you know kind of get around having to keep everything in print <laughs> yeah yeah that just yeah. It, 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 i think people want to see that number and they want to be like cool what's next sure. right Two, exactly three. and i think the, exactly and i think the whole point when you're trying to work with the younger folks is you gotta be on those platforms that they are used to seeing whether it be live streaming uh youtubing uh in our store because we have the arcade and and you know we do magic you go we have yeah. a magic tournament going on right now as we're speaking right and they'll go to one in the morning and you have to have this access to your store that engages everybody so whether they you know go over and and to the playstation area in the store we got eight thousand square feet to kind of gravitate these kids in yeah, but you gotta watch their patterns. So what did I notice? Well, these kids are kind of bored when the when the father gets in. All right, let's bring in an ice cream machine. So we bring in an ice cream machine. So now they're eating ice cream. Well, what what do they gotta do while they're eating ice cream? Oh, they gotta read books, yeah. right? Because they're sitting on the table. Their their father's playing Pokemon. What you gotta do? You gotta get a book in their hand. So I think we have to also take the responsibility on our end, not yeah, just say, that. well, yeah, content and oh, it's not one, two, three, four, five. What are we doing to engage with those customers? What do mm -hmm. we do? The father comes in, we talk to the father. I don't I haven't talked to the father in years. I talked to the kid. Hey, what's yep, going exactly. on? What are you watching? And yep. so I think using them to coach us how to sell one more book Great is, point. Is, is very, very important. But when you look at your store, do you still see the, the demographics like Rob Liefeld said in the comic book world as us still or the 40 and up? Or are, we, are you seeing that 40 and below still coming into your store constantly? Oh yeah, lots. My, 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 my demographics all over the place. I got everybody. Um, you know, young, little young kids, teenagers, 20 somethings, 72, 70 year olds. You know what I mean? Like I got everybody, you know what I mean? Like, like, but I mean, like it's, um, just try to build it. You know what I mean? Like I just try to, I try to have something for everybody. I, you know, like I've got Pogo somebody, you know, you know, somebody comes in, an older dude comes in, wants Pogo. I got Pogo. I got Carl Barks, but they don't want that. You know I mean? A kid comes in and wants to read some gnarly, you know, like, new indie comics or, or maybe they want to get a good manga or they want to get you know whatever like i mean that's part of the reason why um when you were asking about all the different product categories that's why i try to put a focus on having different categories because it, it helps broaden the base i mean everything kind of comes back to comics i just want to sell more comics but i mean like toys games music all that stuff like i got a comic for all those people you know what i mean yeah that's that's i love so, how everything comes back to comics Right. Yeah, so do you, that. right. So do you oversee all your stores or do you have managers that are running them? You're kind of the owner GM. Uh, and do you uh, put your stores in different tiers and demographics uh, based on the product that's selling? So, um, you know, to answer your first question, um, so we, we've got a pretty good infrastructure now. That was something that um, I had to learn 
as a learned skill because like for a long time you know it was a very you know it was a small team um you know we just had a couple stores and um i was used to doing everything myself you know what i mean um and um we've been lucky to have a lot of great people join the team and grow with us um so you know like i have a chief operating officer that helps kind of uh interface with my store managers um you know we have like uh somebody who uh a chief marketing officer helps with like the marketing stuff a lot of the stuff like like basically my goal has been able to take like has to try and take a lot of the stuff that i i used to do all myself and try and kind of like delegate it out to people who i feel like they can do it better than me mm. um and um and and that frees me up to try and do things or learn new things that i'm not good at now and hopefully i get better at you know but like the goal is to always just be growing like we don't um we don't try to run third eye uh, like most retail where it's kind of a turn and burn. Like we want to bring people in that want to be here. And I mean, I've got people who've been working with me for like 10 years. Um, you know, we offer um, health care. We offer retirement plans. We do the whole nine yards. You know, I never had a retirement plan until third eye gave me a retirement plan. <laughs> you know, but like that's the thing, you know, like we want to, we want people, it's so hard to find um and you guys know, like, I mean, like, it's hard to find good people. So, like, when you find them, you want to retain them. And you got to give them that way to grow. And um, when everybody always asks, like, why about us opening, you know, more stores and stuff, um, it's really because, like, I got a really good team, man. And, like, if I'm going to keep them growing, I got to keep growing. You know what I mean? So, like, that's, that's well, the that, motivator. <clears throat> that leads me to my question. So, for 18, 19 years, all I heard was, Double the stores, triple the headache. Don't open a second store. <laughs> Double the stores, triple the headache. And and guess what? I opened a second store a year ago, and yeah, it's quadruple the headache sometimes. Um, it is. You know, but, uh, and, and what Jesse and I love talking about on every show is the diversity of every type of store we go into. Now, up here in Detroit area, we have Comic City. Bob and Jill are good friends of mine. Um, I've visited every one of their, their stores. They all look the same. They have their same colors. They have their same racking. They have their same, you know, everything's a slightly off, but, and then, you know, we all know Phil Boyle and Phil Boyle makes, uh, kind of, he's more of, I think, um, I guess fluid with where he puts it, but every store does the same purpose. And I look at all those pictures of your eight stores. Is it eight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we're at eight now. Now, do you think that, do you have any diversity within those eight stores? I mean, sure, one has vinyl and one doesn't, but where do you put the diversity for each of those eight stores? Yeah. You obviously you, want your brand, you want your, your uniformity, which you have, but where do you kind of tweak it for diversity so you're not sending too much of this product to a store that doesn't give a shit and too little of a product to a store that would sell more of it if you put it there? That's the hardest part. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's tough. You know, the first like so like number one, like um, a lot of our stores are stores where I've had people that I've been friendly with who were looking to retire and um, and they'd sell. Um, and that's the best way to do it, because you you come in and you, you, you really get when you're buying a store like that, you're not really buying the store, or the inventory or whatever. You're buying the knowledge of the owner. You're buying the goodwill. You're buying the relationships so that you don't have to spend two years wasting your money figuring out what works. So like that kind of store, it's a lot easier for me to go in and be like, all right, cool. Graphic novels, new comics, manga. That's what this store wants. This store, back issues, key issues, new comics. Okay, cool. Um, we've also opened a couple of them cold. Um, those stores are so much harder and they take like, I mean, the, the stores... The let me, I'm sorry, let me just yeah. interrupt you real quick, Steve. All you kids out there that are watching Emmett's store, uh, uh, should I open a comic book store? This is my number one regret. Steve is hitting on it right now. Um, it is way easier and way cheaper to buy a failing store and make it better than it is to start from scratch. Yeah, no. Go I ahead, mean, Steve. No, finish. I mean, it, you it, you it, literally hit on what my only regret in comic retailing was. It's hard. It's like like opening cold. Like I've got a couple of them that I've opened cold, and I mean, um, I mean, I'd say one of them I probably still haven't figured out. You know what I mean? Like it's been there two years. You know what I mean? And like you know, it's, it, it's not. It's doing fine. You know what I mean? But it's harder. And like you know, 
that's the thing. Um, you know, another one, it took me about three or four years until I figured out what that market wanted. Um, so yeah, the, having that kind of differentiation about like wh who's carrying what and um, what people want, like that's, um, that's something I'm constantly trying to get better and better at. And with comics, our business is so, I mean, you guys know it's so weird. It's so unique that um, it, I don't, I don't, it's different for every market. You know what I mean? Like um, I have two stores that are two and a half hours away from most of my other stores. And um, those are kind of like my, um, like when I feel like I've gotten these a hundred percent right, then I maybe I'll open more that are further out, but I'm not going further than two and a half hours. Cause if I can't do that, I can't do that. And two and a half hours for comics that, that can change the market a lot, man. Like it's a whole different game, you know, like, so what's so funny is, you know, I got the store in Glendale and I'm opening up the store in Orlando. So you're talking about two and a half hours. I'm talking like 3,200 miles away from oh my gosh. Know, stores. Right. And That's so crazy. Orlando, uh, Florida. Yeah, Orlando. So uh, outside in the land. So we built a, a studio. We're building right. that business, growing the business. We're doing a whole bunch of purchasing, teaming up with all the stores around us, buying their bad stock, which is our good stock. Uh, but what, what I've learned out there is, you know, out here in Glendale, you walk into whatever, 27 stores out here, you're then see Spawn, you're then see Lady Death. I, right. I don't care who you are, where you are. That's what you're going to see. Uh, you get to Orlando and you walk in, you say, hey, do you have Spawn or Lady Death? Oh, no, we don't carry that stuff out here. All right. So trying to run two different stores with two different markets completely has been amazing uh, uh, experience for me. Just the customers, they way the way they buy and, and purchase. Uh, you know, I've bought 16 stores in my last 15 years. And I, so I get it. I understand it. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think it really comes down to what do you, what is, if I was to ask you this hard question, it's probably not a hard question. What is third eye comics in your mind? What, what is your vision? Oh man. Um, I want to be the best comic shop in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's it. No, no. I mean, like, I just, I don't know, man, it's fun. It's fun. Like, that's all I want it to be. I just want it to be fun and like. Like my vision for it is basically um, if I had to really drill it down and get official, um, you know, like and say, like, what's our what's our mission statement? Um, Third Eye Comics is a place for everybody who doesn't have a place. That's us. That's what we do. You know what I mean? And we, we do comics. We do graphic novels. We do manga. We do music. We do toys. We do games. And I know that sounds cheesy, but I mean, that's that's what made me love going to a comic book store. You know what I mean? No matter, I moved around a lot as a kid. And no matter where I moved, I could always find a comic store and always feel at home. And that's 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 the vision, you know, like I want and I want people when they go to Third Eye, no matter where they're from, like if they're coming out here from out west or they're coming, you know, maybe they're visiting from another country. I want them to walk in and be like, yo, this feels like my local comic shop. You know what I mean? And right. that's and, that's my vision. And, yeah. And the great thing about it is you, you started in 2008, right? Yeah. 2008 is you kind of came in when social networking was just hitting right yeah so i don't think you really had that notion where in about 2005 2006 when social network was just the baby steps you came in at a good time so your social networking i will tell you is, is doing this for 42 years and and everything that i've done is one of the top notch social networking uh stores out there um, and you. you also pivot. Do you still do live streaming? I'm not sure if you still live stream at all. I, I, man, I want to get back to it. The problem is, is anything that we do, one of my rules is, um, I have to be consistent. Um, I feel like consistency is key in all success. And, um, if you can't do it consistently, it's not going to be good. And, um, the live stream thing, it's so hard for us to do it consistently. Um, that I just, I haven't been able to get back to it. I, um, I keep I keep thinking about it, and it's something that I want to come back to. I just because um, I mean ma we made pretty good money doing. Oh it. yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna be up in your area, uh, probably in about two weeks. So we'll sit down and we'll talk. Maybe Dude, I want to do it. In. I want to me this, in. <laughs> I want to have this discussion while we have Steve here because, and we haven't had it, and I've wanted to have it for at least the last four episodes. Um, and Jesse is the only. The only 
uh, exception to this rule. Uh, we talk about brands all the time. We talk about your name recognition. We talk about your brand, you know, your your trademark, you know, et cetera. You have a fabulous trademark. You have a fabulous brand. I, you recognize that little mad ball third eye that you, you, your logo. There are so many guys out there just starting out. And I look at 30 years of retailer stores that I've been going to. They don't get this. And like I said, Je Jesse is the only exception to this. You can't just call yourself Dave's Comics. You can't just call yourself Bob's Basement. You can't call yourself Jack's, you know, whatever. You have to come up with a name that describes everything. Jesse, Jesse gets the exception because Jesse James is a whole thing. And if you look at his title there, Six Shooter, you know, it, 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 he's the original comic slinger, uh, yeah. gunslinger. So I, I let Jesse get away with this exception, but there's so many of those guys out there that I see. Uh, Bryce Comics, for example, since we always like to unload on him, who gives a shit? You need to come up with the name of who you are and what you are, and you absolutely are Third Eye Comics. Thank you know what I'm yeah. saying? When I see <laughs> you, the whole hip bald scott ian looking you know uh look Dino tongue hanging see, out <laughs> yeah, you see the mad ball what do you call your little guy oh that's one of the rules the guy doesn't have a name there well, you go see that's I, even yeah. better yeah. we'll never we'll never name we'll never name never name them i gotta so, agree with dennis the the, yeah. the logo and uh, how you guys utilize it and all those great designs that i just ran through only a couple of them it is perfect like there is Thank very you. few and it's always been that way like that's one of the things with third eye is that logo the design of mm -hmm. that guy it's really good uh, but it's, it's so important to all you young you know retailer maniacs out there that want to get in and be jesse or steve or me you have to understand who keeps doing this I'm that's not you doing this it's <laughs> yes it is it's by you do oh. this Oh, when I do this, yeah, yeah. you're here, really right? doing it. You're yeah. singling it. Yeah, <laughs> oh, throw one thumb that. up like that. Just, yeah, just okay. don't touch your belt. If you touch your belt, <laughs> we're in trouble. <laughs> no, but to all you little retailer maniacs out there that want to be one of the three of us, you have to understand. It all starts with these little ground level things that you have to you have to understand. You have to absorb, and that's what this show is about. You know these. You couldn't find three different retailers, all though thinking on a parallel existent plane of what to do and how to do it. And it's from the mistakes that we've made for 42 years. Jesse, I hate, I hate this mirror thing. But with Jesse and Steve at probably 18 years and me at, at 19 years, learn from our mistakes. Learn from our our things that we got right the first time and this is what's going to make you a better <laughs> <laughs> this is what's going to make your first foray into our world a better thing well that's why we started this show uh 100 percent um two reasons one to help other uh, in people in the industry uh be better and yeah. to show collectors and and content and the talking heads out there that we really don't know what we're talking about a lot when we talk about the industry and in order to find that out and to talk about it in, in in the right way you have to have industry people people who are in the trenches talking about it so that, that's why i love oh, yeah, the man. show no, i watch i watch everybody i'm always a student like i yeah. i love i like that's the first thing i do when i go anywhere is i go to shops i just i love it yeah. um i i always am like like, I just like to see what people are doing, you know, like everybody yeah. has so many cool ideas in this business and everybody does something different. And, um, you know, it's it's what makes it fun, you know, and that's that's the thing, you know, like I'm always like, what can I do next? You know, like I'm like, well, what are they doing? You know, oh, that's cool. sure. I'm like, so I'm like, going to ask you an unfiltered question here. Yeah. All right. So let's get on the topic. We got three store owners on here. Uh, Let's talk about exclusives. Your, what, what is your take on exclusives? Like retailer exclusives or retailer like, exclusives? Retailer yeah. exclusives. Um, I mean, I, like like when when they work and the market wants them, I think they're great. 
um, when they don't work, they don't, I, I, you know, I mean, it's one of those things. Um, I don't think I'll ever do um, one of the big boy exclusives again. Um, the buy-in is too high. Um, you know, that, that 2,500 to 3,000 units is just too much. Um, but I, 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 I mean, I just did a really cool one for Farrell. Um, Shout I out Tony, Tony and Trish. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, like, I, I want to support them. And, you know, they they banged out a great cover for me. It's like a homage to uh, to Mandy. Um, and it, it's a cool cover. And, like, that that's the thing. But, like, when I sell my exclusives, I always try to price them. <laughs> yeah, and that dope? Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> That's just yeah. tight. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. we love Tony and Trish over here. We're big fans. Uh, I, I love what they're doing, and I love what they did with Stray Dogs and how they're continuing it with, with great story writing and great, you know, sequential comic book art. There's, it's, it's been one of the things throughout, you know, the past couple of years that we really loved the storytelling aspect of it, which there hasn't been much great storytelling in comics over the last five years. Yeah. You know, it's starting now, but... Um, yeah. They, they're doing a great job and this is beautiful thank you yeah, yeah i mean like I, they, they did it and they did a great job like yeah. like but i mean like we we almost always sell our exclusives right uh pretty reasonably 20 bucks so, you know what i mean i want to sell out there you go yeah it's it's all about selling out you know yeah. you gotta sell out even you know i've done over 400 exclusives now and it's 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 about you you can't say oh my gosh this is cool oh i always wanted to do this it's exactly. about can i sell this out and exactly no 100 percent. yeah and um, that's always the rule too i mean it's got to be something that's gonna it's got to be something that's gonna sell you know right, what i mean exactly like, there's a ton when, of really ones like, like if i did the stuff that i just thought was like cool just to me i mean like man i'd be out of business you know what yeah, i mean like like i sure. gotta do what what what, what to, people to quote want. joe dirt it's not about you it's the consumer that's not, that's not well, like, you know? I, and and so my question to you is if when you when did you do your first store exclusive 2009 2010 do you remember i think it was like 09 yeah it was stuff of legend yeah yeah so what i there's a different world we're in now so when us longtime retailers knew that you had to have a store you had to have a storefront you had to have a tax id it wasn't about selling on youtube and and live streaming right do you think that is hurt store exclusives by allowing people who technically don't have skin in the industry uh, to do them? Or do you think there's no parallel to it and we just have to ignore it and continue to sell? I think honestly, it's the latter. I think we just ignore it and continue to sell. Because okay. um, I think that everything kind of works itself out. Every market corrects itself. And I think that I think that like when you have a store and you have the experience like you guys have, um, I don't have as much experience, but you know, like the, I have a little bit, you know, that like there's always an up and there's always a down. And um, I think that when you're, when you have that, that direct market brick and mortar experience, you know, when it's time to cool it on the exclusives. Yep. And I don't think that that's always the case, you know, look at that. OG. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Great book. Great book. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Very cool. Yeah, I think that's very important, especially um, for a lot of the younger uh, retailers who are getting in this game. That you, what you said about not extending yourself out too much, you don't, you don't want to do another 2,500, 3,000 count variant because it's a pain in the neck sometimes having getting you know having to sell all that and well, it's just what, too what much. was that one store that was like 1.2 million in debt to to one of the publishers or something yeah and that I, I yeah but let me let me set the record straight here if a publisher goes past $100 in debt you cut them off you get to 1.2 million dollars that's no longer the stores uh, bad there. That's the publisher's bad. Well, yeah. We were, see, we're all in the game when we were up against when we were hearing Hastings doing one variant a week and they had 500 stores or 100 stores or however many and then all of a sudden it was like, oh yeah, Hastings owes Diamond $5 million and yeah, yeah no, they're bankrupt and, and they're in Chapter 11 and yeah, Diamond's not going to get that. But but Jesse and Steve and Dennis better have their fucking check the second that UPS yeah. box arrives. You know, I'm like, what, what, what the hell? What the? Yeah. Okay. 
I think that there is um there is a positive though to the online like uh exclusives though um because i mean like there's a lot of artists that have gotten big because of some of those guys who are doing it online only oh yeah um and then that translates over you know what i mean yeah, sure. so like like i i think there's always good you i I'm kind of a, I mean, like people are like, Steve, you're too optimistic. You're too cheerful. But like, I can always find like some kind of way for, for there to be some kind of good to pull from that, you know? Yeah. And um, like, you know, there, there's a bunch of, a bunch of like artists that I feel like um, have gotten put out there and, and put gotten a lot of spotlight on them um, that may not have gotten that spotlight. You know what I mean? So like, cause like, and that's the thing too. I mean, I learned something from everybody, you know, like, you know, so like I'll be like, oh yeah, I, I had no idea who this person was, but holy shit, their art's great. And then yeah, you know, sure. Two months later, you see them doing like you know DC books and things like that. Yeah, yeah. I I think it's a I, I'm for either or. I mean, yeah. listen, we're open society and uh, let people uh, do their thing. I think what happens is when we hear uh, what my fear is that a lot of them are not successful. And right. that what that comes down to is, oh, the comic book market isn't doing well because right. these folks aren't successful. Well, then go to a comic book store and see how they're successful. I think that's very, very important. Uh, you have an eBay store? I haven't been on eBay. I'm, 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 we're going back. Um, okay. <laughs> we, were, we, we were off for a while. Um, and um, I don't know. I just decided that we wanted to go back to it. We, we do a lot through the website. Um, and we have, like, our own, like, um, like – uh, Facebook group for auctions, um, which um, we we put a, a lot of effort into that, and it, it, it does pretty well. But um, but I I want to start doing eBay again, just because why not? You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah, like, I got a lot of stuff. <laughs> well, let me let me ask you this question: um, FMK uh, something Mary Kill. Um, would you rather have sixteen stores? in five years would you rather have eight stores performing at double what they are now or would you rather have one store that is hitting on every cylinder that you could possibly hit on and you know that is doing 16 times the volume or what well you know what i'm saying yeah you know, yeah if you had to pick just like in your heart would you rather have one ten thousand square foot store that's doing 16 times the business and you're doing eBay and Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and, and everything is hitting on every cylinder or et cetera. You know, I mean, um, I don't know. I mean, like, um, like right now, like, um, the record store was hard to open. Um, that's one of the hardest projects I've done. Um, and, uh, it's working, it's paying off. I'm happy about it, but it was, it was it's a big store and it's, it was a big project. Um, so right now I'm like, I'm not opening any stores for like two or three years. Like, I'm like, oh, now we're done for a bit. Um, but like, I don't know. It's all about like, just like where we're at, what feels right. You know what I mean? Like, I think, um, I think for me, as long as I can walk into each of our stories and be happy and like feel proud of it, which I do. Um, and you know, they're all paying the bills and you know, make, making money like i'm happy you know what i mean but i don't really have like um aspirations to do like um like i'm not like all right i want to do one next year and i want to do one next year and i want to do one next year like i it doesn't work like that it, it, for me it's more just like hey steve you know like i'm looking to get out in a few years i'm getting older are you interested and i'm like well let me see if it works you know what i mean and it just kind of happens you know yeah so yeah. I think you're a little of column B and column C. You want probably the eight stores yeah. you have performing at more cylinders per store. Yeah. And just kind of maintain and raise the quality and the relationships. So is that yes. how you chose your locations? It was just by happenstance or, or is there a reason that you, you know, chose where your, your stores are? Um, I so I have a map. Um, <laughs> but I have, I have like a rule. I, I don't open up where there's already a store. Uh, you know, like I just, I, um, I just don't do it. Um, it's a losing battle. Even if the store isn't that great, you know what I mean? Somebody thinks it's great. I, um, I found, uh, just to interrupt you. Sorry, Steve. Yeah. I exactly what you said. I had a map and I put a quarter on the map and I just for size comparison and I drew a circle around and I watched that those little circles 
appear and disappear based on who was closer to another, whose circle overlapped another. And I put a little dotted circle where I thought stores should go. And when some, and that was just in the Detroit area. Yeah. And you are so right. Everybody who overlapped another circle folded, one of them folded up. Yeah. One of them withered up. And, and if you were within a full, and that quarter ended up representing two and a half mile by two and a half mile of the other circle. So it was a total of five miles difference. Yeah. If you were five miles away from another store, you had, I think, a 75% chance of surviving. But if you overlapped that other circle, you had like a 25% chance of not surviving. It's a losing battle. You yeah. know, it's, it's just not worth it, you know. You guys it's, are crazy. <laughs> Brian, should I even tell them where my first store was? Hit them up. I put my store across the street from Atomic Comics. Oh, one wow. The top five stores in the world. And yeah, I went no. put it right across the street. <laughs> so I, I well, think my first store was, was my first store was three miles from Big Ben's Comics in the Detroit area. And I had no idea that the edge of this. See, when somebody drove me to Big Ben's, they drove me five miles out this way, four miles out that way, and two miles this way. And I was like, oh, yeah, they're plenty far away from where I want to open. And <laughs> yeah, then yeah. I didn't realize they were like three miles from each other until yeah. after I signed the lease. Yeah, so, it's, yeah. It's, it's one of those things. And I opened up the store with no new issues. I opened it up with I'm, Lady I'm trying Jeff, to help the Gaspar. other ones, Jesse. Yeah, I know, I know, but I'm, I'm trying to motivate to the, the other people. Yeah, to you, they be, don't uh, have to. They aggressive. don't have to do it the hard way like right. we did. That's easy stuff, easy stuff. But this is how I won the battle. I won the battle by just giving great customer service. There was Less no idea. other thing about it. It was customer service, the best prices possible, providing great comic book therapy has always been our goal. Uh, so you know, it's it's it's. I, I think at the end of the day, if you have a good product and you're building a brand and you're a guy that, you know, shakes hands with everybody, gets along with everybody, uh, I think at the end of the day, you're then be successful no matter which direction you go. Uh, but it is funny when I do hear analogies, I'm like, well, I kind of did it this way. So <laughs> everybody out there, choose your way. Uh, but at the end of the day, remember, I think it's a very important thing to remember. Make sure you're selling product. Exactly. Well, the, the best thing I can say yeah. is like, we're like, like somebody told me this once um, when, cause when, when we first opened uh third eye and just, just to be clear, accidentally we've ended up opening up near other stores. You know what I mean? Like, like, yeah, sure, like, sure. like yeah. it's happened. Um, yeah. The first store was that, you know? Um, and um, with third eye, the original third eye, we were doing well the first couple of years and we had uh, another store open up and, wasn't super nice and i'm like whatever we're good you know yeah. um and i a veteran retailer um said something really nice and kind to me because he had heard the guy talking to me at the show i was a kid i was like 28 you know and he's like just worry about your four walls he's like you do what you, you worry about being what's in there that's all that matters yeah. and like that's that's the motto i've always had i'm like i'm like i'm gonna be better than i was yesterday like yep. but i'm not gonna worry about the other guy and it works. You know what I mean? It, it works, you know? Um, but it's hard when you open yeah. cold and there's a, like you're coming in with another store nearby and it's, it, it is, it is hard. Um, especially yeah, don't, it's so hard. Don't put the extra pressure on yourself if you don't have to. Yeah. Like, like if I, like if I knew if I could have like 17 me's that could be in each of those stores hand selling, maybe, you know what I mean? But sure. It's tricky, but um, but no, I mean, like I've got spots where I I, I want to open stores, um, but I, I usually I'll wait until like you know like somebody comes to me and says like hey or I, I hear something like hey you know this guy might be closing and I'm like hey you know let me let me sometimes people don't even want to be bought you know I'm like yeah I will give you money I just want to I just literally want you to like you know hook me up let your customers know that we want to you know we yeah. want to we want to take care of them we want to make sure yeah. they keep getting their books. And, and real quick, Brian, I want to shout out in the chat. Yeah, we got Three Rivers Comics. Uh, they're in Pittsburgh, and they're uh, talking about New Dimension Comics. So I think uh, Todd Todd is one of my favorite. Uh, I love Todd. Uh, yeah, Todd's insane. Todd's the best. And then uh, we got, you know, Hive is re working wrenches over there. We love Hive. Uh, yeah, Hive's great, And then, too. most importantly, Emmett over at Haven of Heroes, I think we are – 
Um, I think we are putting too many seeds in Emmett's head because he's asking about locations <laughs> and yeah. extra. And, well, uh, you got to keep in mind. And, and the funny oh, part is... Oh, do the is, store, Emmett. Don't. Yeah, that, here's the funny thing. I, I kind of joke around that my store is 3,200 miles away, but I also have, you know, this large eBay store. You know, I have yeah. a, a live streaming company. I have a, a, I'm a beta for live for eBay. Uh, so not only do you have these, your your tangible businesses, you have these outer businesses yeah. as well. So when people kind of say, well, you only got, you have eight stores. Well, technically you got, probably got about 10 or 12 or 13. Yeah. And that's what I mean, makes it challenging. Yeah. I mean, we, we have one store that we opened that's, um, it's a, we, it's our throwback store. We opened that up around 2021. It was like the mid when the supply chain was completely just foobard. You know what I mean? Like everything yeah. was all messed up. And uh, I was like, man, we need we need product. We need Mongo. We need pops. Um, so we opened the storefront underneath uh, uh, our offices. Um, it's attached to a warehouse um, where we do a lot of our e-commerce and stuff. And we opened it and we just caught a third eye buys. And it's all just we buy. It was a store to buy stuff. Um, and um, I totally took the idea from a store in Japan called uh, Mandarake, which is um, a bunch of floors. And they have a floor. Oh, I've can, been to Mandrake. So you know, you know. Yeah. yeah. And that was that was it. And then um we we decked out the front with dollar books and like, you know, fun stuff like that. And we kind of decoded it out like kind of old school. We put old like third eye signs from 10 years ago and made it like a throwback <laughs> floor. So we made it, you know, kind of experiential, but but still another store I gotta run. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah I, I think uh, uh, at the end of the day, you don't have to be at a store to feel, I'll, I'll just use the word pressure. Uh, you could be in Puerto Rico right now and you're there and feel that pressure <laughs> for stores. Oh, I, yeah. I, I think the unfortunate thing about it is we have these. And these, yeah. I, by time I get up at, at five o'clock in the morning, I have had, I'm, everything's done by 7 a.m. Right. right. So now I'm just going in the store and I'm slinging and I'm doing whatever. But even after this show, I go into my, my live streaming show. So we're always selling. Uh, what is your, so what is your, do you have, I know you've, you kind of said your mission statements and your goals, but what do you have going on today as of right now that you can tell us or something coming out over the next couple months? Like that we're working on? Yeah. 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 Anything. Yeah. Um, so we uh, we actually, we launched something really cool uh, about a week ago um, that I've been working on for a while. Um, so um, I'm really ramped up about comics this year. Like I'm always ramped up about comics, but like, I, like just looking at like kind of the roadmap of new releases, it's a good fucking year, man. Oh, I mean, yeah. Energon is going to keep ramping up. I love Ultimate Energon. Ramping up. Uh, Hickman doing Doctor Doom. Um, you Jason know, you've Aaron got, on Turtles. Uh, yeah, Jason Aaron Turtles. Uh, the DC Elseworlds. You know, like you know, Creature from the Black Lagoon. You've got some really dope stuff um, coming down the uh, the uh, the pipe, and um, we um, we. Uh, we're really doing this thing, this uh, summer of comics thing is what we're calling it. And um, basically uh, we launched this thing called Wednesday Warriors. Um, and if you go to the WednesdayWarriors.com, um, it explains what the program is. But basically we did two tiers, um, one limited to 300 um, and one limited to uh, 1,000. And basically um, both of those tiers get you the basic Wednesday Warrior perk where if you're at one of our locations, on new comic book day and you're one of the wednesday warrior members then you get um it, you're one of the first five in line you get the wednesday warrior certified comic of the week for free so like let's take space ghost number one because you know big homie nick barucci is in the room amen, um, <laughs> amen. um so you take space ghost number one and you basically the first five at any of our locations if they've got the wednesday warrior patch or the coin they get it for free but there's all these other cool perks that we kind of baked into it, you know, like we right. do VIP passes for our signings. If you're one of the Wednesday Warrior Elite, you get like the lifetime free VIP and all this stuff. But like the whole point of this is because we're excited about comics. There's a lot of great comics coming out. And every quarter, we want to build a roadmap of touch points for like basically this book this week is Wednesday Warrior certified. You know what I mean? Sure. Hell Marine is Wednesday Warrior certified. Blood Hunt is Wednesday Warrior certified. And we want to like really bring the attention to those books 
and get people excited to go to their their local third eye and hopefully their local comic shop if they don't live near us um to like line up and get these welcome books i can curse on here is that okay of course <laughs> oh yeah you oh, yeah can. sure we're, we're unfucking cool. filthy, baby. Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's yeah. awesome. You know, I think when you pick, uh, when you create a brand and you're trying to integrate that customer base to it, there needs to be some common ground uh, that makes everybody on that common ground together, right? Yes. Uh, by by handing them this book and saying, "Oh, you gotta be the first five. Now, I would I would turn around, and be devil's advocate, and say I would be pissed if I was number six every week. But at the end of the day, that's why you uh, cut people's Achilles heels or do whatever you got to do, uh, put put holes in their tires. But so is this something that you are also trying to get the publishers to be part of this? Uh, I know some stores like myself, I've always been work with the pub publishers on everything. Or is this more of a just a third eye generated project and neither or is fine but where do you find the help coming from the publishers beyond just saying oh i'm ordering it from foc from you yeah i mean for us we'll, we'll send out a list of um of stuff that would be helpful from the publishers um and we just launched it so we're still getting that out to different people i've sent it out to a couple i've got more to send it out to uh watch out nick um and um <laughs> but i but like you know we, it's just a list of stuff and it's not like hey if you don't do this we're not going to do it because right. like at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Like I mean, like it's great when the publishers help, right? But all the all the help I need from the publisher is just give me a book I can sell. Number yeah, two. Steve. Though, let me ask you a question though. I remember I go over nineteen years. You're you're sixteen, seventeen years. There was a point of kind of synergy where DC and Marvel. I want to say it was like 2014, 2015, where I got a box of promo shit every fucking week and my little freebie table was stocked. And it just seems like, and tell me if I'm wrong, maybe it's changed in the last three years that I haven't given a shit and haven't paid attention. But I go into all these comic stores. I don't see bumper stickers, you know, even Prez for President bumper stickers. Yeah. You know, I still have, oh Jesus, that fucking, okay. <laughs> um, so they're 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 coming back to it. Okay, so that's what I'm talking coming about. Coming back it to takes... it. Blood Hunt's got those fangs. Yes. They're, okay, so yeah. but I mean, you see what I'm talking about, though. They've been on cruise control. It starts to slide. Then they start seeing guys like you giving an effort, and then they start coming with the freebies again. Yeah, I mean, like, I think it's and I think it's it's kind of like the one thing that I do miss that I wish that they would do more of. Um, I like the one dollar first issues of like stuff that's evergreen, like the image first. Well, I mean, um, even Barucci had twenty five cent books. For yeah, the those issue. are great. That's like just yeah, like like something that you can like. I like that as like a first taste thing for people. Um, and I think especially with like the the market that we're about to enter, which is really going to be content driven. Like it's going to be a lot of people coming in wanting to buy back catalog, and they're going to want to, you know, get into the the evergreens. I think it'd be smart for them to really kind of get back to what they were doing with like the image first and the DC essentials and things like that. But see, and that wraps around to almost our first question, which is what is it going to take to get those kids back into it? And, and I think that that covers so many generations that you can cover with a 25 cent zero issue, a free zero issue, a dollar, you know, introductory issue, a dollar reprint of the book, right? When it comes out on trade, give me a, give me a number one for a dollar so that i can put that in people's hands and when they read it they come back and buy the 20 dollar trade or the 25 dollar trade yeah these are, these are tried and true practices that in my lowly 19 years not jesse's 42 years i'm sure he's got a hundred other suggestions but th this is a no-brainer and yet you've got to remind these i mean i understand over at dc they don't have a single person that's been that company for over five years but Marvel's got to see it, you know, boom, image, everybody else. They got to see these practices work and they work time and time again. But you they have to be it. We can't make bumper stickers. We can't make 25 cent comics. We can't do any of that. They have to do it. And that's what we have to do at Diamond Retailer Summits is remind them that or Comics Pro if you're dumb enough to pay for your friends. It's got to be, um, it's just got to be smart. Like, you know, like, 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 like 
like when the, when Marvel was doing the True Believers, like um, that doesn't sell anything, you know, yeah. like it doesn't sell anything. But like an Image First Saga number one, I give that to every kid coming in buying a, st you know, like like all my manga kids, you know, I'd be like, yo, I'd be like, check it out, Chew. Morning Glory. Chew. Saga, the the Chew was my favorite. I yeah. made so many trade paperbacks because of Chew, because especially with Saga and Chew, those two had hit astronomical numbers as yeah. far as back issues. And to come along with Invincible and Saga and, and all these were the number one was untouchable. Why would I ever start buying these if I can't get yeah. the number one? You said yeah. that the Marvel True Believers stuff doesn't sell. What about the facsimiles that they've been doing that both I mean, publishers... Those do great. Um, and the true believers, like I will say that they, they, they sell, like they do sell. I disagree with you on the true believers. I yeah. think they sell as an introductory price item. But they I don't, think what um, he's talking about key true believers. So if yeah, you if like, you like, sell Fantastic Four fifty six because it's right. XYZ, you're not gonna get a guy say, Oh my gosh, I gotta go get one through fifty five. Okay, that's at true. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't you're saying it doesn't move velocity on new yeah, books. Cause like I, like for me like I mean like I don't really I don't really need this I don't like it's it's a dollar you know what I mean like I want to give those out, and I want to use those to lead to like like a new sale you know what I mean, um, now the facsimiles like if it's the right book I mean, they all they they murder they do great I mean like we're for still me it was the kindly the kindlies were the king for me. That I I sold so many of that Moon Girl timely one two three. And there, that was such a weird period of time for books where you needed to have a cheap intro to get people to sample it that didn't sample it the first time. Yeah. Or right. You, you had already sold out of it. Right. So, but, you know, and I, I talked to David Gabriel and he was like, yeah, you were the only one that got it, Dennis. You know, uh, everybody else was like, why are you still doing these things? And I'm like, OK. <laughs> and, and one thing before, uh, Steve, since you've brought it up three times, can you explain to the audience what Evergreen is just so that they yeah. understand the lingo? So like a, a good example of an Evergreen book would be like, you know, Marvel Civil War, uh, Batman Hush, Watchmen. Basically, it means something that's always popular, always in demand. Ten years ago, ten years from now, people will come in and they'll buy, you know, Alan Moore Swamp Thing or Civil War or House of M. That's what I mean when I say evergreen. Yeah. Yep. Always good. Um, I, I want to get one f one question in before we let you go, Steve. Um, has there been anything over, say, the last six months that has really surprised you that sold well? Yeah, Ultimate Spider-Man. <laughs> like, I mean, like, like, I mean, I went in hard on it, but like um, the stuff pre preceding it, um, you know, it didn't it didn't blow up fast. Um, so, like, I was kind of back and forth, back and forth on on what I was going to do with it. Um, and I uh, mean, I wish I'd ordered three times what I ordered. You know what I mean? Um, but I mean, you never went broke selling out. You know what I mean? So, like, you know, we, we did good with it. We had it on the racks for about two weeks, which I was happy with. Um, and, um, you know, it's been it's been nonstop. But I was I was surprised with just how big that thing blew up and like yeah and i'm surprised with but, see, but but steve and i think you were at the baltimore where i talked about this uh because i know we've met a couple times yeah at baltimore so you know uh but i'm not gonna pretend like we're great friends and we we hug each other and kiss each other Yet. on the, the Yet. cheeks yeah i love everybody yeah <laughs> um but i was talking about and this was like the the 2010, I want to say 2011. So you would have just been coming in at that time. Yeah, and I was, was talking gun. to Marvel about how at my store and other stores, the customers were just getting married. The guys who read Spider Man were just getting married. They were just having kids, adopting kids. They were becoming parents. And here you undid the one thing that made. Spider-Man resonate with them at that time, which was him being married and going through the married life. And you undo that with the devil, no less. Um, and then all of a sudden, cut to five, six years after that, all of a sudden you get uh, you get brand new day. Or, yeah. uh, or what was it called? Uh, renew your vows. Yeah. Yeah. And and like, guys, there there it is. Look, this thing is. This thing shouldn't sell. 
all metrics that you've been pretending that you were paying attention to. So I don't think that it should have been a surprise that Ultimate Comics Spider-Man with two kids and, and married to Mary Jane, because in this last 15 years that you've owned a store, you've seen how many of your customers have come in with the stroller, come in with the little pack and play, you know, we all saw it. And yeah. I would have thought if I was buying new books, I'm like, that's the one they're, this is my customers. Yeah. They've yeah. got kids and this is the one they're going to jump on. So, I mean, that's just my thought. You don't, do you agree? No, I do. I mean, that's what kept me from underordering. You know what I right. mean? Like, like I wish I overordered because I mean, you know, but like I, um, I was going back and forth on it and there was two things that made me say like, all right, I'm going to go in pretty hard on it. Cause I went in about like three or four times what I had ordered on like ultimate invasion and ultimate universe. Um, and those didn't do good. Um, I, you know, I, I had, I had a lot of those left. Um, so but what it made me do it was um, what you just described there. I was like, and then the added fact that like, you know, the the demographic that, that buys weekly comics is usually between twenty eight and forty. Uh, that's your your Wednesday your Wednesday demographic typically, um, or at least the most engaged of the demographic for Wednesdays. Um, and most of those people grew up reading Ben. This is Ultimate Spider Man. So I was like, mm -hmm. okay, so there's that. And then there's what you described with like the, the, the older Peter Parker. Like that's, I was like, that's going to resonate. And then honestly, like the Peter B Parker thing, I mean, Spider-Verse is still huge for me. So like that angle there, when they were talking a little bit about that, I was like, okay, cool. Like, I think there's enough on this to where it's worth a little bit of a gamble. I just wish I would have gambled harder, you know? Yes, well, and yes. that's what Jesse and I love to talk about on this show with retailers is is it was it that big of a mystery you went heavy you didn't go heavy enough you know but when yeah. i hear all of these people go oh my store didn't realize it was going to be big so that's why they under ordered marvel should have done their job no no your retailers should have seen some tea leaves and and been as smart as steve shout I mean, out to just, uh so uh, i hope i'm saying it right sogama with the five dollar yeah, super dude, this chat comment is fired down yeah here. it says I've been saying this for close to 15 years. Yeah, Western yeah. comics need their own version of Shonen Jump. Also, I remember back around 2015, 16, the big two emphasized trades a lot more, which was good. And great uh, Sepultura style S right there. Sogama, love it. So good the shit. Users. So I, I just don't think this stuff is, you know, Steve, I, I think you're smart enough. You're, you've survived. You're going to be one of the cockroaches that's left after the nuke happens. You know, you're smart Brian. enough to see the writing on the wall. I don't know how to um, do anything else. You're right, exactly. <laughs> but I just don't think it's rocket science. Uh, no, I mean, I'm not trying to belittle what the three of us do. I just don't think it's that much of rocket science when you just put some brain cells to it. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Well, Steve, listen, man, y your stores uh, speak for themselves, and we appreciate having you on, and we're going to do our best to get you on even more. And... and uh, oh, and uh, I've always been a fan and very jealous of some of the variants you did. I just yeah. want you to know that. <laughs> and Thank also, you. thoughts and prayers. You guys, you guys yeah. do awesome stuff, all three of you. Thank you, man. Thoughts and prayers to everybody out there in Baltimore. And uh, hopefully, you. Uh, you know, everything gets, uh, you know, figured out soon. So appreciate what you do, Steve. And we're going to we're going to bother you, uh, you know, in a couple of months, maybe even sooner to come back, man. So <laughs> cool. All right. Man. All right. Awesome. All Make right, sure guys. you guys Thank go you shop so Third much. Eye. You guys have a great night, all right? Love you, brother. Appreciate it. Third Eye or it. die. <laughs> hey, man. Awesome. Good shit, dude. This is amazing. Uh, what a show tonight, you guys. Uh, I want to thank my two co-hosts, Jesse and Dennis. Make sure you guys go check out uh, their socials, shop their stores, shop their eBay lives, their live streams, whatever these guys are doing, go check it out, including this show. We'll be back live next Tuesday with another great show. And uh, man, hey, thank you, you guys. Jesse, Dennis, what a great night, and I couldn't have done it without you. We'll see you guys next time. Adios.